work session to order. Thank you for being here today. Uh, public comment. Clerk, do we have any public comment? We have two citizens who have signed up for public comment. Uh, one, um, please, first of all, come forward. I believe our first citizen is Mr. Larry Pierce. Mr. Pierce, we respect our citizens' rights to address the government in this meeting. However, I uh, plan to and I will enforce the three minute of rule. So please. Uh, deliver your message seamlessly this morning. And once you finish your last sentence, or, or, or if you don't finish it before the buzzer go off, I will politely stop you. So please uh, avoid campaigning or personal attacks against any officials which should be handled in another forum other than this business body. So therefore, you have three minutes and you're on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Father's Day was good. Oh, Mary Pierce. 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Oh, i tell you what, there was a couple thousand people in the Chattahoochee River yesterday, and I was one of them. Oh, wow. Cranked up my little old motor on my boat and went up the river about five or six miles till I run out of water. Got about that deep. Anyway, I didn't know, as usual, what I was going to say today, but I, I could say a whole lot here on this report here by somebody who's sitting here, but I'm not going to get into that. Today. I got something else to talk about. You know, y'all keep saying it's not your job. Well, it ain't my job either. And I put my money where my mouth was, and you see what it got me, right? I got so-called convicted. But they say it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Well, let me tell you, I got two fat ladies. One's down, another one's coming up. So it ain't over. Anyway, at the last meeting, I didn't. I failed to see number six authorization for the chairman to execute. I like that word. A part-time contract for Deputy Corner Chantel Fleming. Let me just tell you the sequence of things that happened here. You know, it, it's like they say: you're hired, excuse me, you're elected, and people are elected, and then they do their jobs. There is no master god up here saying, "Whoops." You ain't doing the right thing. Now, what is the right thing? Well, the right thing is what legislatures put out. Now, Miss Fleming is a friend of the coroner for 20 years, she said in Facebook. And uh, she brought her in somewhere around the fourth month of the 20th day. She got bonded out on the 22nd. So she got a bond on the 22nd. And guess what? She goes out on May. It's supposed to be the first week in May. Okay. I don't know if the corner went with her or not. So she goes out, and the, cal the, the time of payment, it used to be the whole month, but it's not any longer because they're part-time employees, so it's from middle of the month to the middle of the month, middle of the month, middle of the month. So she wanted to get paid. And there's an email to the effect that I don't have it with me, but I'm just trying to be the one bringing you the news. So a phone call's made, <coughs> can you pay her? No, we've already sent that out, it's already gone. You can't do it in the middle of the month. Mm -hmm. And so she went out and, you know, she needed like $500. I say she needed. I don't know if she needed it or not. She lived in another county, come over <coughs> here to get a part-time job. <coughs> let me tell you, that job is not for a woman as far as the elected part. Elected part can be for anybody. But the job itself requires physical strength. Now, when you said here to put the person in and uh, execute an order, the legislatures have not wasted their time, okay? And I don't want to waste my time much anymore because it says here, you shall take the person who you're going to do and bring it to the governing. The exact words oh. is the uh, governing authority. Sometimes don't have it. Mr. Pierce, board. the buzzer has gone off. So the governing authority is all of y'all, not one, Madam Chair. You cannot execute an order for her. It's, un it's illegal. So you got to bring. She's got to come before you, and the reason I say that is Mr. because Pierce, she didn't have anybody. Mr. Pierce, for a year, you've exceeded your three minutes. Yeah, that's what my mom told me. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. We appreciate your contribution, and we can certainly talk. Uh, you know, I'm going to go in the courthouse that one day and just talk and talk and talk. <laughs> yes. And I'll have one or two listeners because the rest of the people is just deaf. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Peterson. We appreciate your contribution to county government. Uh, Ms. Ingrid Landis Davis, please come forward and uh, give us your address and your subject matter. It's the coroner, I believe. Yes. 
Good morning. Good morning. Ingrid Landis Davis, PO Box 875, Winston. Uh, I'm here today to speak about the coroner as well. Today, we are presenting an analysis of the coroner's office activities from 2015 to 2018. This analysis and investigation was conducted by Dr. Bill Willis, Harvard University, and Dr. Lewis Howe, University of Massachusetts Amherst, from source re records obtained via open records um, from the county, and re uh, interviews with <coughs> Coroner Godwin, reviews of films of the county commission board meetings, uh, review of laws and regulations governing the coroner's office and court filings. Uh, Attorney Christine Peterson is handing out this um, study to you, to all commit to the commissioners. I had left a few extra <coughs> copies out, but I see they're gone. They are available um, at dcdims.org or on Facebook. Um, this is a nine-page uh, report, and what you'll find that the, the last line says, these factors suggest that the motivation for attacks against Coroner Garner are political and not an objective examination of her performance. I'll let you get that uh, information. Like I said, it's online. You can look at it. You can see that Coroner Garner is doing her job properly. Okay, okay thank you so much, uh, Ms. Ingrid Landis Davis, for coming today. And we'll appreciate that. We'll take these documents and read it. Okay. Uh, Board of Commissioners, we'll take an opportunity and we'll read these documents. Um, we have a pretty full schedule this morning, so I'll just ask that you all take a look at them um, subsequent to this meeting. Thank you so much, Ms. Davis, for coming in. All right, next we have on our agenda, we have some presentations, but before I get into the presentations, it's my understanding that we have uh, one of our uh, speakers this morning that has to leave, and really, actually, we're number 19. I'm going to give them the opportunity to speak, and they have to leave. So, um, number, tab number 19, I'm going directly into the business items of uh, board of commissioners so we can allow this uh, individual to leave. It says, authorization to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, the Georgia State Historic Preservation Officer, SHPO, and Douglas County regarding the South Douglas Public Safety Tower and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Chief Spencer. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner, for uh, moving this up on the agenda. Absolutely. Uh, Jay Nix uh, is with Motorola. Uh, he, he's our project manager that's building the towers. Uh, he is much more well versed in the permitting process than I am. Uh, so I wanted to make sure if there were any questions from the commissioners, uh, Jay was here to answer them. Uh, but he's got a uh, doctor's appointment a little later, so we wanted to make sure that he made that doctor's appointment because we need him to finish our project. Uh, the, the, uh, the item before you today is just a uh, memorandum of agreement uh, between the state historical uh, people, preservation, preservation office. Uh, and Douglas County, and eventually the uh, FCC, which will allow for our tower down in Fair Play uh, to be built. Uh, we've already got the land purchased. Uh, we've done a little bit of work on it, uh, but we haven't put the tower up yet. We have to get this approval from the FCC first. Uh, and this is just part of the permitting process. Uh, so. Uh, you should have a copy of the uh, memorandum of agreement uh, in your package. Uh, and if there's any questions, we'll try to answer them. Okay. Any Ma questions from the Board of Commissioners? Madam Chair, can I mention one thing as yes. part of that? Mm -hmm. We've looked at this uh, proposed contract, but we also had Motorola look at it because of the cell towers issues, and they've blessed it as well. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, I just, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I just have one again. I'm, um, you know, and, and Madam Chair's pleasure, we're subdivided into different committees, and so I, I'm not as in tune to this one. So the, let me just ask this just general question. Um, so this is a permitting process for one of the towers. Um, is this the same process we've gone through with every tower? What? I mean, I'm just now. Um, I, I just don't remember. So explain what this means to all the other towers. This is the same process. Is there something unique about this one that we have to do this or? Please, no, it's, it, it's the same for every tower. Every um, tower. 
and we went through the FAA process as we normally do. Um, we got the FAA approval on the tower, uh, as we did for every tower, and then also we filed the SHPO and the environmentals like we did on every tower. Yep. And um, the SHPO, which is the Historic Preservation Office, is the one that uh, they found an adverse effect with this tower um, because of view shed. What they, what they delineated is view shed. Basically, uh, there's some historical um, structures that are around there. Yep. Even though they're not inhabited, a couple of them are not inhabited, uh, they, they, they want uh, the county to mitigate um, by providing some services for them to mitigate the, uh, the view shed. Okay, so okay. all right, that's fine. I, I won't get into that. I'll let that, let, let the committee handle that. But m maybe a, a derivative question is that, okay, we've got this tower. It's it's up and going. Um, um, from a, you know, we talked about governance a little bit. A uh, comment was made about governance. Um, and, and, and I'm going to push into oversight uh, and, and you know, sort of the check and balance. So how do we avoid, and, and, and maybe you can't talk about this publicly, but we, we had recent um, situations in the media where somebody jacked, um, hacked uh, a frequency, all right? We're dealing with life and death. We're dealing with our, our first responders. This communication tool is um, it's a good investment. Um, it's not an expense to me. It's a good investment uh, for us to be able to provide public services to the, you know, to the general public. Uh, but with this tower going up, and, and again, all that we're spending on it, my question is how will you deal with um, protecting it from being hacked? Um, and who is the FCC watching and monitoring? I mean, I'm curious on this one. We had to. We actually have to file the frequencies and all with each. Once we re receive the approval by the historical people, yep. Just as we have on every other tower, um, then the FCC <coughs> is the the uh, agency that that we go to for licensing of all of your frequencies, whether it be the 800 frequencies that they communicate with. Or the back call frequencies that connect all these towers together, which is micro frequencies. So uh, it is governed by the FCC. It is governed by the FCC, but okay, you don't have a direct um, answer to my question about okay. avoidance of. And, and again, committee, you guys, I, I'm just curious. I, don't, I won't belabor this because I know Madam Chair, she has a full meeting, but I would like to have an answer to um, what assurances, not guarantee, but assurances that uh, we have protection against people hacking like we've seen recently in the media, but a guy can just get on there and hack a. Hack a tower. Commissioner Mitchell or somebody? Well, Madam Guy, can y'all just take that offline? I, I, again, if it's something that you have to do from a security um, that we need to keep this offline, I'm fine. I just, I'd like to personally know the answer. Well, um, we actually designed the systems and we have been designing all these systems for many, many years. Um, these, these networks, the radio network itself is totally closed. It's not a open network to anyone. Um, if you, if we did experience uh, an interference problem, we would notify the FCC so the FCC could come in and help us identify if there was somebody trying to breach. Right, and then, then at that point, um, they would help us to to determine where this person is or or, or carrier is so they can be resolved. And if it was filtering required, then they would be re uh, responsible for. Uh, filtering that, that uh, interference out. It, it can happen. We can only react to the moment. We'll get to the bottom of it, but okay, you, you sort of, that's enough. We're good enough. I, I got what I need. I'll, I'll double back with the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Commissioner Guider? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, you mentioned that the Historical Preservation Society or whoever, they want mitigation. Are they saying to replace these with something else? Or no. Can, are you at liberty to say what they want? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, for, for the mitigation piece of it, um, originally we, we went through about five different locations in the South Douglas area right around Fair Play. Um, all of those locations are within um, roughly half a mile of each other. So regardless of where, which of the five we'd have picked, or we could have acquired, the county could have acquired, you just still had a historical issue there um, because of where it's located, where the, where the coverage is actually required. And so um, in picking that, the, the last one that we settled on right there beside the church, 
that actually ground elevation came up. So the ground elevation came up about 40 to 42 feet from where a lot of the other ones were. So what we were able to do is mitigate by dropping the overall tower height down about 70 feet, still maintaining the coverage that you need. So one of the part, the first part of the mitigation is to actually reduce tower height from 300 to 230 feet with a 250 foot with appendages, which basically is antenna height, so it'd be 250 foot tall. And then the the second thing that they want the county to do to mitigate is to um, to survey up to 300 historical locations in what they call the Rico quadrant of the state. And that part of that is in South Texas area. Um, and so that's one of the historical preservation. We tried to, uh, to discuss with them to put in markers, historical markers, and um, they, they determined that, that that wasn't something that they needed. They would rather have the surveys. And so what's involved with survey, we actually have, we'll have a consultant that goes out that actually conducts a survey of historical um, locations. They'll, they'll document it with a report, also pictures, and then they go back and they put each one of these into the state's database, the historical database. Mm -hmm. And it takes, um, once you get the material, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes per location. And so there's 300, up to 300 is what they, they uh, verbally have. There's no way of circumventing this. Uh, requirement we can't get our legislators to help um, as the a, governor to help as a last um, uh, I know that politically it um, seems they're, like they're holding us hostage well politically we've already tried to um, extenuate a little bit of that and has helped a lot <laughs> but this is something that they want they require that, that they, the historical people desire yeah uh, and, so, and these these buildings <clears throat> that we're talking about. What are they? Log cabins or it, ducktail? It could be. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Um, one of the houses is directly across the street from where their entrance of the tower site will be, right there beside the church. Um, that house is a 1912 house, and I don't, I don't believe there's anybody that's inhabited a house in several years. It's locked up with fence, and um, so it, it, they say if it, as long as it has. Um, that view of the older design, then that would follow suit. So, yeah. <laughs> this didn't go through committee, by the way. Uh, th this has come up. Yeah, yeah this uh, is scripted from from the radio yeah. system. This came up yes, uh, without uh, going before our committee. That's so, right. Um, I just wondered if there was any way of circumventing some of this. Uh, it's, it seems ridiculous that they're asking for 300 surveys just for that one tower, and it, the tower is for public safety, and they're talking about some dilapidated buildings. Yes, ma'am, I wrote the letter that, that y'all signed, and I, I made sure that they understood that this was not a cell tower. Right. I also made sure that they knew that this was coming out of taxpayers' account budget from the county, mm -hmm. and that uh, um, there was a big difference in the way that these towers were designed from a sailor standpoint versus a public safety and it's not just a loss of money, it's a loss but, of life. But the building that they're particularly talking about is right there on site. It can't be moved and preserved some way like we did at Clinton Farm. Uh, that would probably yeah, I think you probably spend a lot more doing that. Yeah. Huh? I think you probably spend a lot more doing that right okay. than just by doing the surveys that they would like So how much is this going to hold you up? Um, well, right now, we're, we've been really working hard mitigation-wise. Um, we're right now set for end of November for a cutover time period um, for the radio system, and we, we're still working to that degree. Okay. But we we can't foresee what the SHPO people are going to do, but with y'all's mm -hmm. approval of the... Uh, the proposed mitigation plan and the MLA and, and signature to that, we can submit it back to the ship, SHPO folks for them to agree. Once they agree, then it would be forwarded to the FCC for their signature approval. Right. And, and then the FCC would be the <coughs> commanding authority if there was uh, something that came up during one of the courses of surveys. Okay. 
but I don't I don't see that. But that's just they have it in is the. Is this worse than the EPD? <laughs> I had one. I had one several years ago that was actually in an area in um, northwest Georgia, up near the Tennessee border, and um, there was already a tower on the property that was dated from '87 to 1997 that was removed. That was a thousand foot tower, and the tower. They also had another tower on that same property that was 190 foot that was currently there, but it was a guide tower and it was not stable enough to hold what it needs. So we had to remove that 190 foot tower. And we, you would think that because there's these towers have been there on that property since 1987, it wouldn't be a problem. It would have been But the state. historical people had an issue with it and they had to actually, we had to do a full report uh, along with photographs of all the surrounding area of that, that tower. Um, so it held up quite a while. It was like seven months. Do you time. have an estimated cost of what this is going to be? Okay, so right now the 300, um, <laughs> up to 300 surveys um, would be somewhere around $100 per site. Um, that's roughly $30,000. Um, then we have a, we've already, I've, I've already have a consultant that's been helping us mitigate this on on your behalf and our behalf to try to get this resolved so that we can I hate to say pressure but to make people move to get things done and we have that as well as the uh, the management fees to make sure that the surveys are completed and done and so we're probably talking in the neighborhood all said and done 37 to 40,000 all right with that I yield back thank you Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Mitchell. I think she, she asked the question that I was going to ask, but not, so I'm good now. I mean, <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, there's not much you can do with this outside of no, following their lead as to what that is. Huh? Oh, you can call them. <laughs> <laughs> you can call them. I'm not going to get out of it. But, <laughs> but uh, the downside of that is that we you guys <laughs> off the time. Yes, yes. And, you know, <clears throat> but outside of that, I mean, this is just kind of the thing you got to deal with. Yes. So, I mean, the one good thing I can say is that we've, um, with the help of the Chief and Jason and, and uh, all the people bothering everybody has been involved, we've been able to go and do other things um, to not let this deter. Right. Right. Work around outside of this. Right. So you, you keep everything else going and, and right. this piece right here, you just got to right. kind of work within the framework. It's not that they're going to stop you from building the tower. Right. right. The problem is they just deter you until you can get it constructed. Right. right. You know, it just becomes a, a, a nuisance, a basically. Yeah. <coughs> so, I mean, what, what, I mean, there's no other way around it. But no, you guys just keep doing your due diligence. That's what we need to get done. So, but I'll, I'll yield back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mitchell. Uh, Jay just had one question. By lowering the tower, it will not impact the reception, correct? Everything will be okay? No, ma'am. We, we've actually checked from a network perspective with all the microwave. We have them verify that physical pass yeah. survey. Right. Right. And we also, from the 800 perspective, remember we gained the ground elevation? Oh, yeah. So the ground elevation really helps out a lot. Right. But I had my engineers on the, and our engineer for the project rerun all of the evaluation and evaluate all of the coverage and, and it was very good so okay. it's still exactly where we said it would be. Just one last question. Okay, Commissioner Mitchell. Mm -hmm. but, but you did say you guys still will, the height will be lowered but the antenna will still be, will, will yes, take sir. up the difference yes, so you sir. won't you won't lose anything. Right. Right. You shouldn't at least, I mean, you, know, you shouldn't lose anything. No sir, I'm not right. going to No, no, I'm only saying, I'm repeating what you said but I'll, I'll yes. just trying to make sure they understood we, that. We verified that also with your consultant that right. was here with us last right. time. And we had them review that as well, and they Correct. agreed that, that right. the coverage was true. Correct. So, okay. so the antenna will still be there, but you just the tower. What, what, we, what we made up in some ground elevation mm -hmm. really makes up a lot. So in other words, if you gain 40 to 50 foot, mm -hmm. it really takes you, I mean, you know, depending upon the curvature of the earth and, mm -hmm. and what's around that area, mm -hmm. it's, you know, you it's just like building a house on a hill. Mm -hmm versus building it down here in the hole. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you get it up on the hill, you can see a lot more. Mm -hmm. It's all I decided. I got you. I got it. Okay. I give up. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Why don't you, why don't you yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and to Madam point for clarity. And, and again, this is just one of those, you know, this, you know, like our last loss, public safety tends to be the largest spend, which is, which is okay for the sake of the conversation. Um, and I, again, since it, it didn't, so this project hadn't come through com any committee. 
that accurate? This no. problem. This problem. Isn't it? This problem. Not. I can well, ask if. It, I mean, is there a committee that this project falls under? Let's try that. All right, that's what I'm asking. All right, so this is where I'm going with the, and I'm listening to this, and I, I just, and, and maybe Ken, you can help shed some light, again, because it's been a while since we talked about this, uh, but, but our, my, my, our collective experience with the jail, right, it, it's about <coughs> the outcome, the performance of it. If, in fact, we get in here, we spent this money, uh, remind us um, in our agreement, I, I keep hearing these sub-agreements to build and construct, if we don't realize performance, towers, all of this, I'm listening, like, uh -huh, and I won't forget it. I won't forget. And it'll be like, okay, so why didn't we realize what we said we were going to do and what remedies are in place if, in fact, we don't realize it? I understand always the upside, but I'm always, you guys know I'm going to be the risk guy, which is like, okay, let's, let's, let's measure this. If, is, are there assurances? Or is it just we buy the package, it gives us what we give us, it is what it is, you only can see this far, and I'm okay, but still at this price point, I'm just curious. Ken, are there any remedies, if in fact, are there any performance metrics in our contract with them that if they don't, if, if we're going to monitor them and it's supposed to provide this amount of performance, um, do we have any? You're talking about Motorola? Uh -huh. it, I, I don't want to speculate in the public because I haven't read that contract in a while, but I want to say that there were some assurances. Yeah, there is. There, and, we, and we're going to guarantee the 95%, plus we have uh, 10 dB in building mm -hmm. coverage for countywide, 20 mm -hmm. in the city, and then, um, yes, yeah, so there was uh, requirements we had to meet. That you will meet. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. All right. We will meet, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, you know, it just, it, it's okay. I just put the public. Again, everybody doesn't follow. We have new members that come on board with the board that was not involved early on. I think sometimes just to set expectations because we're down a, a path on something with certain assumptions. So I'm good enough here. I'll take it offline with Ken. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Archie. Thank, thank, you. thank you, commissioners, for moving us up. Thank yep. you. Okay. I appreciate it. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioners, in order to tighten the time, or I want to tighten this gap on our time. I'm just going to do a few things before I get to our presentation. Tomorrow, please, uh, please look at your minutes this evening or to uh, whenever before tomorrow, uh, so we can approve accordingly. We have two proclamations tomorrow, proclaiming the month of June as National Reunification uh, Month in the Douglas County, in Douglas County, and then also we have. Um, Tab number five is proclaiming June 26, 2019 as Beauticians and Barbers Appreciation Day in Douglas County. So we have that as well. And then um, I'm going to go on to the next item. If you yes. just go to the bottom of the approval of expenses, please um, we look at your expenses and be prepared to approve accordingly. Now I will pivot back to our presentations. And our present first presentation is a splossed update. So, Mr. Terry Gable, is he, please come forward. Good morning, Madam Good morning. Chair, members of the board. My name is Terry Gable with Moreland Alpha Belly, and I'll be doing the splashed update for June 1st. Slide over just a little bit. Um, okay, I'll try to work with this keyboard and move forward with this. Um, so, first thing up is, of course, the, uh, the amount of uh, expenses that have been invoiced. Um, we're going up incrementally with it. Incrementally with this, it's right around twenty-five million dollars uh, as of at, at the end of May for the amount of uh, funds that have been expensed out with SPLOS. So it's about twenty-five percent of the of the overall SPLOS program. If you break that out by uh, each department, in fire is thirteen point nine million. 
that we've expensed out, transportation 7.4, and then parks and recs is 1.9. Uh, revenues come in for April that's the first month of the third year so we had some good solid numbers as you can see by the graph uh, we stayed well above the projections where, where, where we want to be uh, obviously beat the last three months we had some better numbers uh, in the past 12 months but overall I think historically that it's looking good over the last 12 months and with the solid numbers coming in the first month of the third year uh, hopefully that trend will continue and we'll uh, we'll we'll continue with an overage on it. So looking at the hard number for uh, April it was 2.3 million. Um, and if you compare that with the projection, um, we just right at the beginning of the, of the last year, the projections for two for the third year are going to be just a little over 2 million, 2 million 36 thousand. If you compare those two numbers, we're about 270 thousand dollars over what was projected. So again. Uh, the number's looking good, and hopefully that'll continue through the third year. Mr. Gable, uh, yes. Commissioner Guyton has a question for you. Go ahead. And, and I don't know whether to address you or Jennifer. Do you think the online sales affected those three months, <coughs> those low three months, <coughs> December, January, and February? Are they taking longer to send the money back to us? It's a combination. Um, because, you know, even still, we're not getting all the taxes from online sales. Do, do you know how they distribute that money? Do they go by zip code? Because a lot of zip codes cross county lines, like in uh, Carol, uh, Mirror Lake, you know, is uh, also the same as uh, Villarica mm -hmm. in Carroll County. Mm -hmm. And we've got Paulding County lines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered, has anybody talked to the Department of Revenue about this? Or Clint Mueller with the ACCG to see how they're distributing that money, how they're determining what county the money goes to. Because we have a mall in uh, 30180 over in Carroll County does not. So if they're giving our money, because <laughs> all of Mirror Lake is in Douglas County, if they're giving all that money to Carroll County, that could be affecting this. Has anybody talked to Clint to see how they're I would doing say it? I, I have that personally, but I know that ACCG, you know, keeps tabs with, you know, the, the sales tax and how it's collected. Um, I think Georgia, uh, Georgia Department of Revenue is getting better about knowing who is um, or how the money is coming in because everything gets reported to them. But I still think they have, because we get twice a year, we still get pro rata, what they call pro rata shares of you know, lost and lost. Maybe those are the iffy, the ones that share a zip code or something. Yeah, from what we've been told, that it's just because the Department of Revenue just doesn't know who they belong to. So it kind of makes me wonder um, you well, know, how much I of served that. on that committee one year, and they were, they could not, they said, we don't know how to handle this. We don't know because of the zip code. You can't go by zip code, and I told them that the, the address file could mm -hmm. provide that. Mm -hmm. But um, it's probably on the form that the business returns, the, the, the sales tax form that they have to return <coughs> to the Department of Revenue. Um, maybe they have to indicate what county. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, I feel like mm -hmm. the, the what? I'm sorry. The form that they have to fill out to say they, the, they, the businesses, that they have to for, uh, fill out. Well, they may not know. Oh, that we know what, what, what county we're in as a business. I'm not talking about local businesses. No. I'm talking about online businesses. They may not know uh, where the person lives. That's where you pay the sales tax. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway, I'll give Clint a call and yeah. see if I can figure out mm -hmm. what they're doing. But it just seems like we had a dip for three months and then it went back up. It did. And I mm -hmm. just wonder if there was a delay in receiving the online sales tax. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're not we're still people. receiving every online sale if we're not getting the sales tax from that. Still. I'll, I'll call it and get an update mm -hmm. on it. Okay. Yeah, get back get back it. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Commissioner Dyer, for calling and giving. You said you'll get in contact with Clint. You uh -huh. for us. Yeah. All right, Mr. Gable, you're back on. Thank you. Okay. If we look at the uh, the total of the three years uh, so far with the with the program, uh, we're at 51.7 million total. 
Um, if you add up all projections, 50, about 50.2. So we're carrying about a $1.5 million overage right now. So again, um, we're in pretty solid shape with the revenues and we'll look forward to seeing them continue in at the pace they're at. Um, just real quick with the bond service and the payment ob obligations starting the new year. Uh, so we got new numbers. The, the, the months don't change. We'll, it'll, we'll have a payment in October as we have been doing and then one in April of 2020. This will be the highest payment for the, for this, for the uh, payback. It's right at $20 million, just below that. The first payment will be about a million, and the second one about $19 million. So we'll get those taken care of, and um, then we can continue with the revenues coming in. We shouldn't have any issues of meeting those. So with that, we'll, um, I'll go into a few project updates and try to get through these uh, quickly. That's the completed projects for fire. So just to recap real quick with a, with the digital radio system that Jay and the Chief have been talking about. So it, it's boiling down to the three sites that uh, they're working on currently. Uh, the Austell Gas and the Factor Shows are well underway. The tower is up on one of them. And they're, I think, currently installing the tower on Factor <coughs> Shows. So those are progressing and should finish up uh, fairly quickly. And then the remaining site for the tower is going to be that South Douglas site. Um, which will be pending the MOA and, and, and SHPO's approval for Jay and them to get started back. They have cleared it, uh, and that's all he can do right now until we get uh, confirmation on the, on the MOA. But it sounds with, you know, just based on what he keeps saying and, and said again this morning, he feels like he, he still gets the target date of November 1st, uh, even with the slowdown with that property. Uh, the ambulance procurement purchase order is going out, and uh, the ambulance is in fabrication for 2019. They'll just uh, just one ambulance, and then the, the fire truck, um, I believe, is uh, is being will be advertised for bids soon, um, as we did last year. Those go out for bids, and then vendors uh, will bid on that, and we'll get those back in, and uh, once they've been out. Um, and advertise, we'll get those back in and, and make a decision on, on a vendor for the, for the fire truck. And again, that's just one fire truck for 20, 2019. Station three, uh, the project's completed. Uh, all that remains will be to do a final closeout uh, with Titus Construction on it. Um, we do need to get the uh, temporary housing removed. And once we get everything disconnected, we'll get that out. Um, as we've mentioned to the board, we have a ceremony is scheduled uh, for June 26th, I think from 3 to 3 to 5 for a ribbon cutting uh, at the fire station. So I think now everybody's looking forward to that uh, and be able to show tell the uh, chief's new, um, new re renovation project. So turn that very nice. Uh, staff vehicles for 2019 with the chief, there were three trucks that were going to be ordered, uh, two or three. Um, have been ordered now and they're uh, equipping those and we'll get the remaining uh, truck as we move into 2019. Uh, station 9, I started reporting on this and this project is out a little bit further in the program um, as far as how everything is set up funding wise but we, the chief and him had, Alan Bell did an initial design on it early on and we decided to go back and, and and meet with Alan Bell was the architect and we've got a meeting set up with him tomorrow to it'll be an opportunity for the chief to sit down with them we'll look at the plans that that they initially drew up and it'll be basically to go over the scope of the project and we can talk to him about anything or chief can about anything they want to add or change and once that meeting takes place we'll be back uh, with the with the fire committee to to review the proposal from Alan Bell and make a decision if we want to go ahead and, and move forward with the design on the fire station. The good thing about that is we'd be able to get some hard numbers on it. It doesn't mean that we got to let it at that time, but we can get it designed and get it shelf ready, and we'll, we'll know exactly where the numbers are coming in. Because obviously we've talked about it with the, uh, the operational cost and staffing it is going to be a big expense too. So we are taking that necessary step to move that project forward at this time. 
And then with that, I will move into transportation. Mr. Miguel. Completed projects. <coughs> and then resurfacing. So, um, <coughs> no updates. Uh, as I said last month, C.W. Matthew was awarded the contract for the SPLOS projects for 2019 and the Elmick project. So um, they mobilized and came in and did Lee Road and um, finished that project. And they, they left the county and they're uh, scheduled right now to be back in at the end of July, 1st of August, and they'll complete all of um, the Elmick projects and the, uh, the, the SPLOS projects for 2019. So that'll, that'll catch us up there. And then maintenance is continuing to finish uh, the El Mig 2018 El Mig actually, you know they ran a little bit behind with the fire and slowed them down. So by the end of 2019, we should be all caught up, at least with the list and prior list, and, and be starting 2020 with a, a new list. But I'll keep reporting on this until uh, we get um, CW gets back in and we'll get um, get them started back up with the remainder of the projects. Uh, the pavement evaluations are ongoing. Mr. Gable, we yes. have a question for yeah. Vice Chairman Robinson for you. Yeah, yeah just, okay. just, I want to acknowledge, um, I want to acknowledge um, C.W. Matthews' effort, Miguel Valentin's effort for getting, and Mark Teal's effort for getting this floss, I'm sure, off the ground as it relates to repaving. This is something that, um, um, it's been pent up. It's not that we haven't been resurfaced, but now I think the public gets it, and they put the real demand on us to, to deliver uh, with the right expectations, but but we, we raised up on that Lee Road. Um, it's something that we had been, it, it was sort of a pent up need, um, and we had to make some serious maneuvers, and I want to acknowledge the efforts that you guys had to do to get that done, um, and it was a long time coming. I mean, obviously, we, it got media attention, which was after the fact. We already knew that, but we appreciate them amplifying it, And uh, but I appreciate the effort um, because, I mean, I get calls all the time from citizens going down the street with their window down saying, that, look, I'm on Lee Road. It mattered. Right, with that important, so I appreciate that. Also, at the same time, I want to thank your staff, Madam Chair Miguel, for getting his in-house staff to go over there um, 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 on Interstate. Was it Interstate West? Yes, sir. Interstate West Parkway. Um, the ownership of the home to Suites and the Hilton. Um, Dr. Patel is very pleased um, by the fact that, of course, he built a new hotel, renovated a hotel, and paved his own parking lot. And we made a concession to pave. Um, the front road there, um, which um, they tore up, and it was something that was the right thing to do. We appreciate his commitment to the community with over roughly about 222 beds. Uh, we appreciate that. And you also did Walmart, is that correct? Yes, we did. Did like just some of the things that people don't get, but uh, it mattered. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I just want to say thank you for making <coughs> that done. No, I had to say that. Absolutely. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Um, <coughs> so the payment evaluations that are ongoing. Um, we're on track. I think we got a target date of around August the 1st to have it completely done and turned over to Miguel. Uh, we probably have two or three weeks left to do the field work. And then the focus will be on the on the software program itself and getting and making sure we've got everything in it that's needed, uh, um, getting down into the weeds of the program. Uh, once we get that finalized and we've got plans with Miguel to uh, start setting up training uh, for his staff and then of course we'll turn over two licenses for, uh, for his staff to be utilize as we as he moves forward with the program so we'll real quick we'll jump into the intersections um, Stuart Mill Road at Reynolds Road um, is nearing the completion of the design phase I'm hoping that uh, by the end of the month that Jacobs uh, will be getting Miguel the, the, the roadway plans and the right of way plans for him to start reviewing and, and hopefully start getting out and, and looking at the right of way impacts. Um, I've got at this point, if depending on the right of way and the impacts with the right of way, uh, we'll gauge when we can get this project let. Um, it could be towards the end of the year, again, depending on the right of way, but we're, we're moving forward with that and have them in Miguel's hands, hopefully by the end of June. Bright Star Road at John West is in Miguel's queue. Uh, I keep asking him, and um, we're hoping we'll get this project bid out this month. Um, as we, we've been reporting on, and also Sweetwater Church that we partnered with Paulding County on, we'll hopefully get both of those out uh, June 1st, and it'll be advertised, of course, through uh, through July, and we'll be able to get one of get some of these intersections 
um, get some uh, contractors on the ground and get get started with them. And I know there everybody's been anticipating some of these intersections getting started. Chapel Hill Road obviously is a little bit larger project. Um, right now, SEI is the consultant that's doing the design on this. Yes. <laughs> Mr. A guy has a comment or a question for you. Yes, uh, on the Bright Star Road, um, what is the delay there? Because, you know, school is out, and it would be the ideal time to get that intersection done. Uh, I thought it was going to be... We are in the process, we're in the process of getting the, uh, the properties, uh, the acquisition that we need to be able to let the project do construction. Is there a hold up? Because that's no, been the just, same report every every time. It, it's uh, a matter of scheduling all of the closings for the parcels, but we're very close to being able to move the project. So when do you estimate they would uh, start <coughs> this work? Because uh, after school starts, that's a major intersection for the school buses and the school traffic and everything on John West Road. Based on the schedule, the way it looks now, <coughs> sometime in August would be when it would start. And it will be ongoing during the school season yeah. towards the end of the year, so there's no... This is no adding order. just a little through lane, right? That's correct. And it's going to take two or three months? It, it's going to take probably six months total to do the deal. It's got the... It's a, it. it's it's a difficult intersection. Years. It's got, in, it, and I've talked about it before, it's got two large drainage structures right at that intersection. And then with all the, the you know, you got to be very careful as far as environmental on it. <clears throat> it just delays it. It's a, quite a process to go through. <clears throat> but that has delayed them um, in getting those those drainage structures um, sized properly, and, and, and that's what's driving some of the right-of-way impacts. But we're there. Now we didn't go through all that. Um, is the good news? But it did take it did take them some extra time to do that. It looks like a simple project from the top, but it's it's a little complicated up underneath. Okay. okay. And you were asking me earlier about Yancey and and uh, Stewart Mill Road, Miguel. Is it uh, just a quick update on the construction of that intersection? That the construction is coming along. Uh, it should be completed before the end of the summer. Uh, it, it just kind of slowed down there for a while. <laughs> it just seems like uh, putting the sidewalks in has been taking forever, and then uh, the siding and everything around that. But uh, what about the Reynolds Road and uh, Stuart Mill Road? Uh, where do we stand on that? Because it affects two of our districts. That's still on the design. Yeah, that's what we were just. That's the one we were just talking about. I thought it was just, oh, I thought you said Yancey. Well, you had asked me earlier what was the status of that okay. one. I was just, I was shifting gears on you real quick. Okay, And I'm I was going to let Miguel give you a quick update on it. But um, there again, it's been in design forever, and they were, it was uh, a design addition or change. Why is it taking so long to get that design? What they tell us is that the hydrology was a little more complicated than they initially. What figured. is that? You know hydrology, what the water that's, is? <laughs> storm water. that's determining storm water. the drainage, the culverts, the pipes that go under the road, uh -huh. and the elevations. And because the project was delayed, the field conditions changed. So they had the pipe set at a certain elevation and now they have to go back and make sure that they were setting them at the proper level. Would you have an estimated time for that project? Well, based on, on what uh, Terry just mentioned, we, we anticipate uh, that they will continue the design, finalize the design and get us plans. Um, by the end of June, by the we'll end hope to have plans in Miguel's hands. And then you will start the right away. <coughs> and, will right and that will take how long? It could take four to five months. So this is not going to happen this year, as stated earlier. Well, the pro depending on how quickly we get the right out of the way, mm -hmm. would be when we let it. If if we can let it in October, November, 
then some of the work will start during the year. But if the right-of-way acquisition uh, drags on till November, December, then it will be a spring project. Okay, because uh, as I've stated many, many times, that's a very dangerous intersection, <coughs> lots of wrecks. Okay, with that, I yield back. Okay, thank you so much. Vice General Yeah, yeah, just kind of just relate to that. And that I wanted to to, uh, to Terry and, and David Good. W one of the things that we've emphasized in times past is for you to acknowledge the commissioner's concerns and comments. Uh, I know I see you have a um, um, an enhancement to this book. Her comments that she just mentioned, it, it, it strikes me as being relevant to capture sure. uh, dangerous intersection. Um, you know, six months delays. Don't just let that fall on deaf ears. It's just sort of like my street lights. Don't that, don't let me keep coming back. She shouldn't have to come back in six months, nor should she have to remember <coughs> what she has mentioned as being a concern. Right. And, and sometimes I get concerned that, you know, we have this pretty book, but then um, I think again, can you make sure that that's added, please? Yes. All right. It'll make sure that comment is acknowledged. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. To and just good. Commissioner, you finish? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Right. Just one more okay. point. Commissioner. That was originally in the 2002 splash that did not get funded. So that's why the people in that part of um, <coughs> Chapel Hill subdivision coming out there uh, are very concerned. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Mr. Gable. Okay. Uh, Chapel Hill Road is, is still in the design phase. Uh, we're SEI is doing the design on it. They're targeting um, around August to have right away plans to Miguel. Uh, again, this is one of our larger projects, transportation projects <clears throat> outside of Lee Road. <clears throat> we're going to have about 30 parcels that are going to be impacted. So we're looking at a 12 to 18 months for the right of way there. But uh, we moved forward with design on it. We need to get it to that point uh, and get it in Miguel's hands so he can start the right of way for it. Um, and we'll continue to track it as we move through that phase. Yeah, Mr. Gable, Commissioner Carthen has a question for you regarding the Chapel Hill. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it may be towards Gary. Have you already started identifying those right away and even, you know, this Miguel? Miguel. Miguel. Yeah, Miguel. You said Gary. I know Gary said that too. So. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, preliminarily we know the properties that are likely to be impacted however um, when the design is underway we look for ways to eliminate have the need for acquiring the right of way mm -hmm. so depending on how the design progresses some of the parcels that we know that could be impacted may be removed so it's an iterative process Mm -hmm. And we, we do not, we can't go out and begin the acquisition process until the design has been finalized enough for us to be able to get a, a legal description of the area and go through that process. So one of my concerns is that we will do the sidewalks on Chapel Hill. We'll get the right of way for that. But then when it's time to widen Chapel Hill, it will take even longer because so can we look at getting right of ways that will mitigate us having to do this all over again when it's time to widen up? okay yes for for the area related to this project we have done we have identified the right of way that would be needed for the uh, future widening okay. project okay. and at least for that three-quarter mile close to a mile right. project we would be acquiring the right of way that we would eventually need. Now, obviously, we would not do the, the widening there right. beyond the turn lane, mm -hmm. but we will have the right of way. So when we engage in the project in the future to, to go to four lanes, mm -hmm. all we would have to do are improvements <coughs> with, within the pavement okay. of that area, and, but the right of way would be. Alrighty, so we're looking at this not actually happening until 2021? 2021. 20. 2021. <clears throat> if it takes a year, and to Miguel's point, and that's because we are looking to get try to get the right of way for the future project, it's taking a little long for the right of way phase. So, if just say a year, um, yeah, you'd be you're looking at 2021 as far as actual construction. Yeah. 
Okay, you Okay, it's the gate on you. Okay. Have the floor. So Highway 5, the right turn lane at, at Douglas Boulevard. Um, Miguel and Emory in the final selection phase of, of the on-call consultant. So this is one of the top projects that they'll sign to for a task order. to start to design on this project and get um, and get this project underway and get it towards construction as well. Uh, Post Road Bridge, no change there. Uh, again, it, that uh, that's a GDOT project we're waiting on. Uh, the contractor to move them to uh, Douglas County. Terry, could you tell us a little bit about Highway 5 this uh, week, if you could just regress a little bit and uh, commission it. Uh, I want to know the end timeline on that Highway 5. Um, Miguel tells me that we should have a, a design team start out in August. Um, we have, I'm sorry, Bill Peacock, director of purchasing. The, the final uh, RFPs for those on-call services are due this Friday. And from that set of RFPs, then Miguel and, and the evaluation team will decide which ones he actually wants to use going forward. So once we get that done, we'll bring it back to the commission for approval, and he'll be able to actually start the, the engineering work. And that's design. the design. The design. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. You can proceed, Mr. Okay. So, in um, the sidewalk projects, uh, and speaking specifically of the first two, Slithia Springs and Chestnut Log, um, SEI has completed the plans and has sent over to Miguel uh, for review and approval. Um, and his staff will be working with them closely with we probably will end up with some um, some easements for the projects as soon as they work through that uh, we're hoping we can get, get these let in the fall and then the new Manchester project at the high school uh, there's no right away uh, involved here at all uh, but uh, SEI does have to fill out the encroachment permit for GDOT and we've got to submit that to GDOT They've got a review process, but as soon as we get that back, which we're hoping to be in August, we'll get this project let. Right now, targeted date is going to be August. And GDOT will drive that, up, uh, just controlling it based on getting that permit back, telling us we can go to work on this state route. Whitestone covered. Uh, with Miguel, we're just waiting on him to issue a notice to proceed to the contractor, and he will get started with. The needed replacement of the culvert. The uh, the lights. We're showing out 20, but it's at various locations. Uh, we're still getting uh, final numbers from Greystone and Georgia Power um, on the scope of, of each location. Once we do that, uh, Mark and Miguel and I will get together and, and start making some final decisions and bring it before the board on on moving forward with those. Highway 92 at Mount Vernon. Uh, I was finally able to get some um, folks out of District 7 uh, that I was able to converse with. Uh, they they have got this project on their radar. Uh, we it, uh, Miguel and Mark have already had numerous conversations with them, and this has had some history to it with GDOT, and somehow it got dropped. But I think now we've got it back uh, up at the top. Um, He's telling me that they do have to go back in and, and, and update the study. Um, I don't think, based on what he's telling me, that's going to take uh, any length of time. I'm still hoping this project will get, will get in partnership with GDOT, will get going this summer. Uh, and he realizes, I've told him, that we've got, we've got sheriff's deputies out there uh, that are monitoring intersections, very dangerous. So we're on it and just keep pushing. We'll keep pushing GDOT to, uh, to get get this one uh, designed and into construction. Mr. Gable, uh, Vice mm -hmm. Chairman has a question for you. Yeah, th this is a project that um, <coughs> has been on our books for quite some time. It was obviously advocated for the Commission of the process for District 3, uh, which I um, uh, obviously obliged to continue to push this forward, even though it was in my district, because again, it was originally District 2, uh, uh, due to redistricting, was shifted a little bit. 
Um, so I acknowledge the need for this. We've got this new school. There's a safety issue. We appreciate public safety. I need this to be acknowledged, that this is something that, and Miguel, you know this, but I'm doing this for the record. Um, th this is something that needs to have attention. We don't need a reactionary to the moment, right? We, we recognize we're doing the best we can, but sometimes uh, if the local government um, is providing the resources, providing the capital staff, <coughs> providing, providing the initiative, doesn't necessarily have its hand out looking for like we just look for permission to move. Sometimes I look at both state and federal it's like okay usually it's the other way around we're not ready our act is not ready but this delay what, what, what's really happening I mean I understand the state government budget has you know grown obviously since House Bill 170 and they were able to put a billion dollars for infrastructure and transportation you know what they got close to a 28 billion dollar budget they were giving money to teachers I get all that all we're asking for is a little permission to move forward, right? We're, 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 it sounds like it's an administrative, it's like, okay, it got dropped. Is it because they don't have the resources there to do the work? Or, I mean, did we do something that caused it to drop? Because, you know, I'm always mindful, what did we do? But if we didn't do anything, what's really the issue? I need that to mark. Why do we keep coming back to this, this topic? Um, Commissioner? It's not anything that county did. Uh, we submitted uh, a report to them actually prior to my arrival here. So a long-standing project. Initially, <coughs> they acknowledged and accepted that report, which is what, what forms the basis for them to issue the permit for the signal. There was personnel changes at GDOT that caused this item to be dropped. And the new personnel, uh, they don't have the same comfort level as the previous personnel, and they're wanting to have another look at the numbers in the report. They want more current numbers. They indicated, because we had provided them everything they needed initially, and it was on their side, but it didn't progress, that they would come out and do the analysis and then clear uh, the intersection for the permit. And that work is what we're waiting for. Okay, so, so, so it's a do-over. Um, so, so what happens with institutional knowledge, and I, and I get it, we have it here at the local level, you've got leadership changes, I don't want to do it that way, I want to do it this way. Um, I get it. Uh, I just wanted to know just how, how we can sort of get this on track in light of, of, of that shift in and, and um, discretionary decision making. How do we, how do we, is there anything we can do? And it sounds like you're doing it. Now, Chair, I know you're, probably, you're aware of District 7 for GDOT. I, I get all that. We're just trying to, you know, let the public know that we, we, we recognize it. We hear the complaints about as a school bus is making a left turn. This is just pent up. And we're just trying to put the record show that we care. We're trying to move this forward. But I keep hearing the, well, what happened? I've heard that four times. What happened? We shifted leadership. I know that, but we're trying. So this study that you're talking about, this seems to now be the, the latest poop. Um, what is there a cost to the county to pay for this study? How long is it? In, where is that being factored in? Can you just answer that? The there, there is, uh, Commissioner. There, there is no you're cost. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Very good. Uh, in answer to your question, Commissioner, uh, we, we, there is no cost to the, to the county as a result of the last iteration. Now, initially, the county did have a study that, that I don't know exactly what the figure was, but that was paid for, that was turned over to GDOT. Okay. Because the project didn't progress, they agreed to whatever information they need updated for them to do at no cost to the county. The problem is, or the issue has been getting them to do that. And Madam Chair has been in contact with them. I have been in contact with them uh, several times. And Terry has uh, been in contact with them. So I think we're approaching it from many different angles to try and get that to happen. However, because the work is being done uh, in-house by GDOT, we do not have direct control of the schedule. But we're paying for the light. 
Are we paying for the light? We would, we would pay for some uh, of the cost of the installation, yes. And GDOT would also participate. Okay, so it is a shared cost, and therefore, since they, they basically since, we, since we've got a, we didn't like your local work, or because you weren't shovel ready at the time that you did the study on the prior day, okay, you've got it. You see the shift, it sounds like we missed our window. We weren't ready. I mean, it should have been done when it was done, but now here we are, right, before it BM, and so here we are. And I appreciate you trying to clean this up. I'm sure we get it. We just, it just again, one more time, we hear a lot of technical talk and all that, but for the, for the public's sake, they need to understand. The backstory. So what's going on? I, I, I think I'm. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner uh, Do you have a comment? Uh, a question. I no question. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I thought there was an issue because it was so close to the existing mm -hmm. light. Was it not? This is. Um, that is not converted. In, that, in this, in not this intersection. No, I'm talking about Riverside and that We still. Oh. Have I'm no, sorry, I walked in and I said, <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'm still back on um, sorry about Mount that. Vernon. I yield back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I did have an opportunity to meet with uh, Commissioner McMurtry. Is it McMurtry? McMurray. McMurray. I don't want to his name. Um, this past Thursday, and I um, had an opportunity to express concerns about both Mount Vernon and Highway 92, Riverside, and he pulled it up on the screen and we looked at it and he, he said, wow, he couldn't believe that citizens were trying to get across four lanes of traffic. And so they assured me again, they're going to expedite it. So uh, if you could, he'll just pick back up on the conversation. I just met with him on Thursday, him and his entire team, and pressing those two locations along with the 92 project as well. The mayor met with it. Okay. Note that in our sidebar. And our, the Madam Chair met her on the please. Thank you. Yeah, that, that'll certainly help. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Highway 92, uh, Riverside Parkway, possibly traffic signal. Um, this will be another project that Miguel will sign a task order to the on call consultant once we get them selected. And hopefully in, in August we'll start that uh, study to determine what, yeah, again, like Mount Vernon. Uh, what's feasible and what GDOT will will approve. I mean, this is a, a new one we've added uh, to the um, to the SPLOS projects. Uh, it's it's referred to as supplemental striping. It's an element grant that that uh, Miguel applied for and, and was received. Uh, that GDOT offers local governments. There's a match required to it. Um, so and that's why we got we got it in splash the match will be paid out of splash um, and we'll just track this uh, Miguel will do it as I guess as we move through the year uh, he'll he'll be letting out contracts and uh, for the for the striping but we'll track that as we move forward the road widening project um, I think on the agenda is uh, recommending approval for um, to bring back the original consultant that designed the plans for Lee Road to get the plans updated uh, so that we can move forward with uh, to construction for the for the overall widening project. Miguel thinks right now his target for that is uh, June of next year or fall of next year possibly get this uh, project out uh, to let but it, again that's going to GDOT is, GDOT is a partner with that and of course their contributions funding wise is going to be a critical piece of that component and then with that we'll move into parks and ricks <coughs> boundary waters restrooms is substantially complete we've got one repair that we're making on some on the stairs um, but the contractors telling me we should have that done within the next couple of weeks we'll um, I think tentatively we got a, a, a ceremony plan for the for the building uh, in July, July 10th, I believe. This is our uh, contractor took this for me at night, and it's, again, it's just a nice looking building. And with the uh, the night lights, uh, with it, it really turned out nice uh, as far as the the structure itself. <laughs> The uh, software lights are finished. We have the lights tested. 
Um, and we're good there. It's just a matter of filing this project out and closing it out with the last invoice. Uh, just a quick shot. Uh, it really lights it up out there. You can see the concession building to the right. Um, and then there's an up close picture of the fields. So we're almost ready to turn both of those fields loose and uh, I'm sure they'll be used quite heavily. Uh, the Dealer Park Tennis Courts, we are, I've been talking to the, the architect and we got a target date of finishing the design on this. Uh, the first part of July, we're gonna, we need to get it out on the street um, and take bids on it. And then we'll, we'll take those bids back to the uh, Parks Committee and review those again and, and see how they're imp impacting, obviously, the, uh, the other projects on under Gary's department. Uh, what we are moving forward with on this is uh, integrated construction was awarded the, the demolition of the, of the tennis courts and the lights of the old ones. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move forward with that and, and have, the, have the site cleaned up and be ready to go to, to go to bid when we get those in. With our two uh, big projects, I'm glad to say that we are, and I'm going to talk about this one in the Senior Center County together. Uh, they're tracking and they've stayed real close, uh, but we're in the final design phase of both of these. You know, I think I'll be reporting that we would get them let in, in June or July. And we're going to be real close to doing that. Uh, all the plans have been submitted to James's office for review. We've even passed through WSA on the, the rec center. We've gotten approval there. Uh, as soon as those comments come back, the architect's going to be ready to put these out on the street. Uh, so it's going to be kind of exciting, a little bit nervous. Hopefully we'll keep your fingers crossed our bids come, uh, come in. Uh, um, around what the, uh, the architects have, have estimated. <coughs> estimated. Thank you, Robinson has a question. Yeah, this, this is a question that, that you may be commissioned. Somebody <coughs> can give me some insight. Um, again, you're communicating with us. Uh, I, again, maybe you mentioned I stepped out, but um, as far as communicating to the public um, uh, about, I'm gonna just stick to the community center, uh, um, the community center, um, what are we doing to enhance that communication beyond coming to my town hall, which is what once to once a quarter at, at, at best? Um, what, what are we doing in the meantime to communicate? Um, um, I, I know I heard in times past that there were signs, or and I'm, I'm focused on other signs, but right now, can y'all give us some insight on that? Yeah, and Dave will step up. <coughs> but we've had, what, since over the last probably four to eight weeks, we've gotten pretty aggressive with signs. Um, David, you want to speak about locations of signs and, and renderings and where we're at with that? Uh, yes, sir. David Good, Communications Director for the SPLOS. Uh, right now, uh, we've actually have put out, uh, there's two signs uh, downstairs in this building for, for the public to come in. We also have a rendering of the Senior Center over at uh, Woody Fight, and then we have a rendering of the Multipurpose Center um, over at, there at the TAG office. <coughs> we also have uh, printouts. Uh, both the building and then the floor plan, and we have put them all throughout the uh, throughout the county, so people can get that understanding. I'm um, also I emailed each commissioner with the designs themselves, so you guys can have them. But we make sure that anywhere that I go, anywhere we go, that I take those renderings with me and share them with the public. Did you have a question for me? Yes, no, no, oh, just okay. I mean, I. I, I so you said there's site plans that you're going to be putting all out, right? Which is just right here, right? Correct. Site plans and rendering, and so people will be able to pick these up and read them and get access to them. They come in contact with us when it has a specific purpose to come to the county. Correct. Uh, task commission's office, courthouse. Um, so either I got a trial or something, I want to come see the commissioner. I go to tax office, pay my property, tag a title, whatever monthly basis. Um, but think about the 80 percent of the people who just go to work. Right. They really don't interact with our government, but then they may pass by a key area. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Please? Right. There are also our physical signs. Um, there will be a sign over there where the actual location is. So it means at Boundary Waters, there will be a large sign there that says what's coming. Same thing with the senior center. And then off onto the road itself, there will also be signs there that's going to dictate this is how your uh, opinions are being spent. 
If you think about the new fire, the fire station renovation we did at Fire Station 3, there will be a sign there that says, this is where your splash dollars were spent. Your splash spend is at work. And, and, and I appreciate that. It, again, uh, we interact in our, our, our little soul core of, of, of activists and people who are involved, but you just be surprised. A lot of citizens just don't know. Correct. And every every moment that we have to sort of just put something in front of them, even if it's just a symbol, again, everybody's got their own world, right? Um, they interact accordingly. They trust that their government is, is operating on their behalf. Right. But these signs do matter. And, and Commissioner Mitchell, I know you, you've been instrumental in ensuring that we got them, and I'm sure this is important. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, again, highlighting that it's coming. It's okay that we're here. I'm not going to talk about the past. I'm talking about it matters. So I just, uh, the quality of the signs, make sure that people see um, the value um, of, of their dollars and where it's being spent, it matters. That's all. Just want to drop on that point. And also, one last thing, we mm -hmm. also uh, make the information available on social media as well. So those who actually just like to hop on the computer and look at things, they can also uh, see things out there on social media. Thank you. Any other questions for me? I just have one question regarding locations. I know you said you have the Boundary Waters area. It sounds like you have a rendering outside of the is it on a big four by four, or what do you have it on? You know those big four by four. Right, I'll be there. Uh, I'll be there four by four. Because yeah. I can't no, yeah, no. four by four, four by eight, four by eight, four by eight. Yeah. And you know the only thing that area is a little remote is you know, tucked in the corner. Is it any way you can kind of grab where those freeway? I don't know if they put it up there. Yes, yes, there's a smaller one that actually is going to be up there on the road closer saying what's coming to that area. Okay. So we will have that as well. Okay. Sounds good. <coughs> I know Commissioner Mitchell is working to help push this forward. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Right. I don't have any other questions. <coughs> we have floor again, Mr. Gable. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. Um, Bill Art and Fair Play, if you remember, we we bid these two concession buildings out. We have the bids in. Um, we are we 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 reviewed the bids. Just haven't made a, made a recommendation to the board yet. We want to get um, the Deer Lick Park um, project alpha bid and get it back in. That way, the staff can make good assessments on on the on the projects and where we at from a budget standpoint. <clears throat> and Mr. Peacock told us we have 90 days for the bids. So we should I'm keeping my fingers crossed. We should uh, have everything in. And, and be able to move forward with the bids on these two projects, pending the other bids coming in. Uh, the Fair Play uh, Park lights are wrapping up. The con contractor came in Friday. Uh, Greystone got out, got the transformer set. Uh, we, we've tied into it now. Uh, just a matter of getting the inspector out and get it, uh, get it approved, and the Greystone come back up the power on it. Uh, and we will finally have some lights uh, returned at uh, Fair Play Park. <coughs> I don't know Gary and they're going to do a lot of managing, trying to keep everything going down there. Uh, Mr. So we'll probably get that back. Mr. Gabe, I hate to interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Sorry, this is, this, it will help. So, <coughs> uh, Commissioner Carpenter has well, a oh, question for you. I'll let you yes. wrap up, but quickly, going back to the Fair Play and Bill Art concession stands uh -huh. in relation to the tennis courts, can you kind of shed a little bit more light on that? Yes. As to so, um, the, as far as the priority order of the, of the SPLOS projects in parks, the tennis courts are number three. They're above the rec center and the and the uh, senior center. So, um, Bill Arp and, and, and Fair Play, are da they're down on the list. We actually got ahead of schedule uh, in just getting those designed, uh, which I think with the, with the way bids are coming in and as high as everything's coming in, it was probably a good move. Now we know, we'll know all the costs. We'll know exactly what the costs are. And trying to stay with that priority order, uh, obviously with the, with the tennis courts up at the top, uh, we wanted to have that bid in hand too, um, so that we can that needs to have play a big role in, in in the projects as we try to decide if the budget starts getting tighter um, and make what decisions we need to make as far as the projects go. So uh, that that's the reason we're holding Fair Play and and, and Bill Art right now is to uh, is to get the the bids in. I'm hoping we'll have them in on the, the Red Center and Senior Center. Um, it, we may get pushed for time with those two, uh, but certainly the, the, the tennis courts will get those bid out in July and be able to come back to the Parks Committee with uh, with some numbers and, 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 and discuss that. So at that time, can we get an updated list of the projects? And the at list? that time, I'll have a, all the projects that Gary has and then updated numbers 
so that you can see the full picture of where we're at. And then at that time, we as commissioners may have to look at, or the committee may have to look at the prioritization. Of yeah, and, and just to, just for information, so we, we did we did an updated estimate on the on Deer Lake tennis courts, uh, and it came in just this is just an estimate provided by the architect, but it came in a good bit higher than, than what the budget was. You know, I'm just talking about the tennis courts, and that's that's what's kind of guided us to go ahead and and finish the design on them and get them bid out, so we, we know exactly what we're doing. Okay. Yeah, I, I just want to begin another marker. This, this is important. Um, we're going into what our third year of the SPLOS. Uh, I want to go back to the original list that was originally created, and we took the Wall Street <coughs> bond. Um, it was a set of projects based on just what we knew at that time. All right, we've gotten into this now. Um, we've had a chance as um, commissioners to talk to the public to understand what what's really important. Um, and so while we've got projects that are on the list, the Mitchell will on the list at the top that make the cut, there are some things um, that um, as we've gotten into this that have moved into what we call a yellow zone. May not quite make it, and we know stuff is at red, that okay, if we have pay go at the end. I, I think this, um, Madam Carthen brings up a good point, at least in my mind, which is let's not lose sight of how we talk about certain things and let's be cr crystal clear as relates to commissioners what's actually on the list that we know is going to get done. Um, I, I just don't like to mislead the public, or uh, and I don't, um, as it relates to what, what we're working on. Um, if there's some interest in moving some stuff around, I mean, in light of, right, well, okay, well, we got a little bit of gas left. Um, I, I think we need to identify that. And it's okay to have the conversation, but again, our hand was not dealt us. It's just what staff gave us to begin with, but we, we do get to touch it. But. Uh, again, it's going. We've always said it. We know that eventually this bonding money will uh, will be done, and then it's going to be pay go, and that means it's a much slower roll. You need to start setting expectations now within yourself, and especially as you articulate with staff, because the only the money is only that you got. That's all we got. So we can't get ahead and making these promises and thinking we're gonna go. We all, you know, it's a dollar there. And we're all grabbing for this out of ten dollars what we need, and there's going to have to be some things are going to. Um, um, some things are just not going to get met. So let's just be honest about what we're looking at. Um, let's have the conversation. Let's do the studies. Let's do what's necessary uh, to balance this thing out. But I'm, I'm just, we're in the third year. We're at the turn. Uh, we've got two more years left. It's going to get tighter. And so I just see as these construction costs as demand, as the, as the general economy is somewhat healthy, uh, obviously there's pressure out there. People are getting work done. Cranes are going up over in Atlanta. They're building out. Stuff is going to continue to increase. Um, that means that the things over here are going to be just as expensive. So I'm just saying, I'll leave it at that. Okay. You that? No, I, I yield that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Cairo, I believe you have a comment. Well, uh, earlier in your presentation, something was mentioned. You mentioned something about the um, Interstate West being paid. That wasn't on the list. Was it paid out of splash or was it paid out of contingency or what? And how much did it cost? <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, out, of, out of initially the funds were taken out of uh, the general fund, our, our uh, existing budget. Uh, <coughs> We are hopeful that we can cover some of that, uh, but as the bills keep coming in for the materials, we may need to supplement that from SPLOST or some other source. So at this point, we are floating that, uh, those expenditures out of the general fund, out of our existing budget. How much was, it? was this project that was not part of SPLOST to begin with, how much did that cost? Uh, at this point, I don't have the final figures on everything, but I would say probably uh, in the neighborhood of about seventy-five to eighty-five thousand. That would have built a concession stand, is what I'm saying. Things like that should not be taken out of SPLOST without the board knowing it. And. Uh, 
because it pushes our needs, and I'm not <coughs> saying just wants, I'm saying needs, and Fair Play and Bill Art pushes it on further down when projects that are not part of the splash is taken out. It should not come out of splash, is what I'm saying. It was never part of the splash thing. Commissioner, the those expenditures are allocated in the SPLOST by category. So expenditures for resurfacing would not impact a different category of the SPLOST. It would just stay within the allocation for resurfacing. So what, what uh, category did it come out of? Is what I'm asking. It would come out of the resurfacing component of SPLOST. It hasn't come out of SPLOS yet because we're, we're fronting it out of the our own budget so far. But anytime something comes out of SPLOS that was not in SPLOS, it pushes the, uh, the miles to be resurfaced, it pushes it down further. So uh, I just do not think it's proper to take $75,000 out of splash without it coming before this board. And with that, I will yield back. Okay. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Adam. Vice yeah, I, comment I, yeah, I appreciate that. Transportation is one of the areas where we try to at least be equal in this distribution. Each commissioner has an opportunity at the beginning of every year to look at what list of streets, what's their priority, uh, and to work with staff. Right. Um, I don't ask Commissioner Mitchell for permission on how he or get involved in how he sets his priorities for District One. Right. Um, if I'm looking at District Two, and uh, we have resurfacing that is going on, and you've got economic development that's also coming to play, which is like okay, they, they don't operate in a vacuum. Right. So in District Two, you've got somebody who's put up 200 rooms. Right. Who has fronted paid their own money who paved their own parking lot, who asked for some help on, yes, I know I talked to those just on this road, but can y'all help us out? There's a lot of potholes, a lot of Cobb County is tearing these things up. We're not really doing all of it. And we go to staff and we say, Miguel, how, how can y'all help on this? Like, can y'all help mitigate this? Right? Not $8 million worth, about 80000 Right? <coughs> 200 rooms, rolling. Right? And so it's one of those where that's a trade off. And so for that means somewhere in District 2, that means yes, I had to make a decision, like we all do, to say, okay, that's a priority. They put they they're vested. They put money in. And so rightfully so. They asked me for comments. I went to Madam Chair accordingly. <coughs> Staff, can y'all work this out? Can we do something for this particular <coughs> area? Uh, no other district is impacted just the list that I'm responsible for providing input on, like all of you are with your respective districts, <coughs> right? And, and one more time, it's advocating. It's advocating for, it's, it's just advocacy. It's not impact anyone. No, no other category, nobody's district distribution. Just that anything that was in my list is just, I have to, I got to reset it, this is a priority. <coughs> and so I have to be accounting for my district on um, who gets no different than Lee Road, anything else, like I had to pull that up to the top of the list, like I understand guys, but that's a major thoroughfare. You have that discretion. I appreciate her comment, she, she's accurate in the sense that if there is, the way she described it, if that impact does happen, then yeah, we should pause before the Board of Commissioners. But we have discretions as commissioners, continue doing what you've been doing since you guys have all been here. Right? It, it, there is no imposition. But Miguel, to your point, duly noted, you fronted it, we know that um, obviously we're trying to balance this out. And, um, but I, I think we've got a good handle on it. I'm going to yield. Yeah, I'm Thank you. Okay, Wait, just to clarify. Go okay, <coughs> is that was that part of your LNIG? Well, it was not on. It, it was on the initial list. He had for District Two. There were mm -hmm. two roads on there: Lee Road and Interstate West. Because of the budget estimate, we had a drop interstate west and Lee Road stayed. However, after we've done Lee Road, there appears that the original budget that would have that uh, 
was earmarked for Lee Road may very well cover Interstate West as well. So there may not be any additional expenditure by doing both of those roads because of the way the expenditure went in the work. You didn't explain that to begin with. You just said it would be coming out of the contingency fund and then possibly splashed. So you're saying that the the road, uh, that the allocation for District 2 uh, that was originally allocated, it was, it helped pay for both projects. Well, the reason I explained, yes, Commissioner, the, the reason I explained it that way was because at the time the decision was made to move to do that work, we didn't have the final figures on the expenditures. We had to make the decision to move on that project. We knew there would be some savings. We didn't know if it would cover all of it. So we fronted it with our existing budget with the anticipation that the funding would be there. And it was there, possibly. Possibly. Some of it <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, um, as the commissioner re uh, 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 stated, we each go over our list, but we're each allocated 25% of the the total uh, LMIG program for the year. Um, I have 34% of the roads, um, and one district has um, uh, less than 20% of the road. So, because the city does some of the, the road. So, uh, if we're going to stick to the 25%, which evidently nobody hears me when I say this, it ought to be by percentage of roads. Um, but uh, I just don't want um, one district just because they belong to the Transportation Committee to have additional paving that was never approved. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I just that I, rules are rules. Right. Is all I'm saying. I think you have better understanding now that it was LMAG. So now it was associated with the LMAG since you. you but he still says it, it will probably come out of splash, possibly come out of splash, which I do not approve of. But with that, I yield back. Okay. All right. We need to keep moving. Uh, you are you. Mr. Yes, I, I'm, I'll wrap it up. I'm done. This is the equipment for Gary. Uh, we basically uh, through that. And we have he has a few more funds left, and I'll maybe we'll report on that next month. But I'm finished. Okay. No more Thank you. Any questions before the board? We, I think you're covered all the covered everything for us. You have um, a communication update for us. Uh, well, then there's not this month. You don't have anything. Okay. Mr. Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well. We appreciate you. Sure. And if uh, we have some questions offline, we'll just uh, contact you. Okay. Board of Commissioners, are you all hearts and mind clear before I get allow Mr. Gable? Yeah, I'm going to let it go, membership. But just, just as a clarity, wait till you. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Yeah, yeah, real, real quick. But, but rules are not laws, though. I want to be careful with the commentary. No, I, I don't want to be political at the moment. It, it, it would it, it, it be a no win situation. It, when, when we're not done in a vacuum, our job is to advocate on the citizens' behalf to the administration. And I've always been an advocate. It has nothing to do with the vice chairmanship. It has nothing to do with chairmanship of a committee. It has always been advocating for my district. But I'm always sensitive to other citizens, my other peers, and so forth. If I'm willing to sacrifice, like, okay, to my citizens, you're on my list. I know the list of for, for at least three, four years out. And I know the list of the original list that was given us is supposed to be re-rated here pretty soon and get that list done. And I know that eventually we're going to get to them. But I know if I, I'm sacrificing to the future for today, that's my choice. Right? So that means that in the sliver that I'm allocated, that means that somebody on the list that District 2 is allocated, whether it's the next year or the following year. Because I make choices like, well, 75% of what, uh, what was Riverside took 75% of my budget one year, just wiped it out. But it was the right thing to do. 
it was the right thing to do for my district. Right? So that means the other things that was on the list gets pushed down because that was a priority. The road also is a major corridor. It's like, yes, I have to make concessions for my district. I get it. I'm sensitive to you guys, but also I'm looking at staff like, okay, but you also got economic development. You now have to figure out how are you going to do it all. SPAS, LMIG, you've got economic development, you've got to pay these. Mm -hmm. Those commercial people have rights and interests mm -hmm. as well. Their roles need to be paid just as much as these residences. Y'all need to figure out how y'all going to do this. Right, so we can, we can take from the future and make this work. Y'all make that math work. But get this done has no impact. That means that, well, Commissioner Robinson, you're going to, you know, this is going to ship your district two down. These, like, okay, I get it. They now become yellow, they become red. That's for me to manage. But you only have so much dollars. If you only got a dollar, you can't overspend that dollar. That's all you got, whatever the impact is. But I want to, I want to be careful. I don't want to politicize what, what we're doing. Right? I, I, I won't get into the redistricting of who has the most roads and so forth. That, again, that's going to get done here soon. Uh, but let's let that go. Let, let's, let's be honest about what we're looking at. We're all managing our list. We all care. Nobody's trying to compromise somebody else or something like that. Like, stop. We're, we're okay. Manage your list. Set expectation with Madam Chair and her staff. Make sure you deal with your, your citizens and your priorities and we're all good. Staff, y'all make sure y'all balance this thing out. But nobody, I, I just, I take, we take a bench, you know I'll rise up to it. But it's just, I don't, I don't have to go through all that because of a title. It's because of who I am. I don't need a title. I, 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 I don't need a title to advocate for my citizens. And I think that's always important. That doesn't make me who I am. <clears throat> I always hear this thing, oh, he got the title. He got the check. It's like, take that off. I'm still going to be Kelly Robinson, Commissioner of District 2. And it does not bend. Right? I advocate solidly. I don't need a title to be defined. So I'm good with this. I, I just, again, if you want to argue about how we allocate, mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. But don't make this about because he has a title, because I'm more than that. And it, that's, it's not necessarily as an insult, but it's like it, it needs to be addressed here in public. I'm good with that. I think we'll move forward, and I'm uh, very optimistic that we will get to fair play in Willow Park because uh, hopefully, and I'm a uh, no grand said. woman, that the senior center and also the uh, is it the community center, the rec center, the rec center right. will come in right at target. So we're just going to just stay optimistic because those two parks definitely need to be addressed. Okay? We'll Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to our next presentation, which is the final findings for the Entrepreneurial Incubator and Accelerator Study. That is our own Executive Director of our Economic <coughs> Development uh, Department, Sarah Ray, who is our, is she here, Sarah? Oh, I didn't see her. Our own Executive Director of the Chamber, and then we have Dr. Greg Henley here today as well. Take it. Executive Director, we, we will not belabor um, the the main uh, the main attraction here. Um, is, you know, we came before you earlier this year um, to kick off uh, this study, um, and as you all know, we've been under this community and economic development strategic plan. Um, we have four pillars within that plan. That fourth pillar is is building business success. And under uh, that pillar, um, it calls for the establishment of an entrepreneurial hive where startup businesses can learn, invest, and grow in Douglas County. And more specifically, uh, calls for the, uh, the conducting of a feasibility study to determine the perfect mix of space and services that will energize startups in Douglas County's target industries to locate and grow. This could be a blend of accelerator and maker spaces. So it calls for us to do this uh, this year. Um, it ultimately has been done by Mr. Kinley, and so this obviously is, is an effort of, of this community economic development strategic plan where both the Chamber, Economic Development Authority, and other businesses in the county and city are a part of in ensuring that we're moving the community forward in the right direction. So Mr. Henley has produced that, that study. I don't know if you want to add anything. The only other thing I'd like to add is to um, just thank the Board of Commissioners for contributing towards the Community and Economic Development Strategic Plan um, with supporting um, Mr. Henley's study. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. It definitely shows that you guys are a player at the table, and we truly appreciate that support. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, um, Executive Directors, for coming. 
forward to just introduce our wonderful speaker today, well, Dr. You, Gregory Henley. Thank you so much for coming thank you. forward. It, it's, it's really good to be here. I, I'm not used to these meetings, but I get a sense that it would be important to you for me to just get to it. So, so I, I'm really just going to give an overview of the study. It is a written study that is fairly comprehensive. It's been put online. The commissioners have hard copies, I hope, yes, of the did. study. Yeah. Uh, so again, this is just to give a, 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 a an overview of what I've done, what I've found, my recommendations, and so forth. What I'll start with is the purpose of the study. Uh, one of the premises is that for the long-term health of a region, small businesses are very important. And many regions provide specific initiatives that help small businesses. Mm -hmm. So one of the purposes of my study is to try to, to provide the Board of Commissioners with what makes the most sense here in Douglas County. Uh, Douglas County has done a really great job of bringing larger corporations to the county. They've made an investment for corporate relocations. The two bigger names that we're aware of are Google and Switch. But even beyond that, uh, my hat's off to you for the success that you've had in attracting and retaining larger corporations. Uh, a second purpose is to update a study that I did in 2010 here which was a feasibility study on business incubators. One of the things that has happened since 2010 is the business incubator model has evolved. And I'm going to talk in just a minute about some of the ways it has evolved. A third purpose is to focus on what Chris alluded to. Avalanche Consulting came in a couple years ago, made some specific recommendations on helping small businesses. So this is further taking that study to some specific recommendations. Uh, importantly, one of the mandates I had was to educate on the different models available to entrepreneurs. And I said a minute ago the incubator model has evolved. It has evolved to include things like business accelerators, like co-working spaces, startup hubs, and, and so forth. Uh, I will tell you what those are in just a second. Uh, in addition, from an educational standpoint, the study includes best practices, as well as a lot of examples. Question? So, okay, great. And most important, the, the purpose of the study is to help the Board of Commissioners to decide on the best course of action. So the study provides a lot of information. I have made recommendations. I have also looked at several alternatives, which I'm going to walk you through in just a second. Very quickly, uh, what a business incubator traditionally has been is a physical facility that houses startup companies, nurtures them via education, mentoring, coaching, so that after usually a three-year period, they're ready to graduate and better compete in the, in, in the real world. What a business accelerator is, is an evolution of that model where the accelerator will also provide space, but usually for a three month period, and normally for technology companies, providing education, mentoring, and coaching, but on an accelerated basis. Business accelerators, again, are typically uh, focused on technology businesses. They will make an investment in the business. And after the three-month period of mentoring, coaching, and education, the technology companies will then make a, present, make a pitch presentation to investors with the purpose of getting an equity investment in, in, the, in the company. The third model that I want to talk about is a co-working space. A co-working space is not necessarily designed for the startup but startups will come into a co-working space. And what the co-working space does is collects rent. So the, the companies who come into the co-working space are tenants. Uh, many co-working spaces also provide education in the form of, of workshops and seminars, but that's not a requirement for a workspace to be a, 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 a co-working space. So far, so good. 
the approach that I took. I updated the 2010 feasibility study, but I went way beyond that. Uh, went way beyond that with trying to get qualitative data here from Douglas County and also beyond Douglas County, as well as quantitative data. So the qualitative data that I got were interviews, and I believe I was able to talk to a really good cross-section of folks here in Douglas County, including business owners, public officials, larger organizations, educational institutions. Um, I also talked to, outside of Douglas County, entrepreneurship center directors. Uh, collectively, I'm terming incubators, accelerators, co-working spaces as entrepreneurship centers. So I went beyond Douglas County, certainly the Burson Center in Carroll County is, the, is one of the closest uh, entrepreneurship centers and it's a pure business incubator. Uh, to Douglas County. There's a, a business accelerator in Cobb County, again, relatively close to, to Douglas County. I've actually been a mentor there, so I was involved in coaching some of the companies in the business accelerator in, uh, in Cobb County. Uh, I went far, as far away as, as Jacksonville, Florida, <laughs> quite frankly, because I, I wanted to see what was happening uh, elsewhere, you know, outside of, of our local area. Um, so I got some information from all those sources as well. In addition, I got data from the International Business Innovation Association. That's the trade organization for entrepreneurship centers. Several years ago, the trade organization was the National Business Incubator Association, but because of the evolution of that model, it's now folded into the INBIA. I also got information from the Kaufman Foundation. Uh, you may know that is the premier foundation for entrepreneurship research outside of academic institutions, uh, as well as the Brookings Institute, and I read a number of white papers and articles. I also have some personal experience in, in this area. So that's where I got my information for the study. The summary of the interviews. Uh, the first half of this reveals interviews of the non-business owners, and I was not surprised to see that there's <coughs> tremendous support and cooperation from the community for this initiative. One Douglas is the term that I found, and I again I found that to ring very true with all those who, who I talked to. What was a very important mandate for me was to that, that the initiative must help not only startup businesses, which is the way most entrepreneurship centers are focused, but here in Douglas County, existing businesses are just as important. So again, this entrepreneurship center is not focused just on startups, but startups and existing businesses. And therefore, we need to create a unique model. Um, Again, one of the mandates was, let's develop a model for Douglas County that meets the needs of Douglas County. Not necessarily a model that's been done before or is just like any other, any other place. So my goal was, what is the right model for the needs of Douglas County? Um, making Douglas County attractive to young talent was also something that came up. So I, I've talked to several uh, uh, interviewees who have focused on youth and several who have focused on young women as well. So that's another piece of, of this puzzle that we need to put together. And importantly, creating an atmosphere of innovation and entrepreneurship. The business owners told me that they're looking for connections and information education connections that the, the type of connections that came up more than any other were connections to potential customers. So one of the things that suggests is that larger organizations here need to be part of it as well as governmental uh, organizations. The information that I would say the majority of those who I talked to were looking for could, could come from uh, seminars and and workshops, more so than a, year, a formal education such as a year-long class. 
Although some did say that they would value that, that year-long class. In today's environment with short attention spans, a lot of the information that we get is from workshops, seminars, even online sources. Uh, so that was something that was a little bit different in terms of the approach that I took. Uh, the business owners also suggested that office space was something that they valued. Office space such as what incubators do is one of the things that they value. But one entrepreneur I talked to started her business and moved her office to Atlanta because that's where the co-working space was available. She has subsequently moved to Douglas County because there's co-working space available here. So I thought that was very, very informative. Uh, the thing that I was surprised about in talking to the entrepreneurs is that they were looking for information to get started. Virtually all of them said great things about the chamber. But one of the things that, <clears throat> that, that stymied them a little was, OK, I have this idea. I have this business. What's the first step? Where do I go? They wanted a place to go for information, a startup workshop. Um, where do I get tax information? Uh, so the, the beginning process was something that uh, is, is extremely valued. And again, where do I go was one of the, the things that came up when, when talking to the, uh, uh, the, the business owners who I talked to. And what is really important is there's a lot of resources already here that can answer some of those questions. But it's not clear that all the entrepreneurs know where to go to get it. So the model objectives uh, were, again, helping new businesses and existing businesses. And importantly, they have different needs because they're at different stages of development. We want to retain and also attract talent. We want to bring talent in. Uh, in terms of retaining talent, what became apparent is that there are very bright, for example, high school students who go away to college and may not come back. And that's one of the things we want to change. But we can also attract talent to Douglas County. In doing the 2010 study, my remark was Douglas County is a hidden gem. We're so close to Atlanta, so close to the airport, we we'll to start bringing some talent here as well. So that's another objective. Uh, in addition, we want to create an innovative and entrepreneurship atmosphere. And I think we can do that by creating an, an entrepreneurship ecosystem, which I've, talked, which I've listed here a little bit later. Uh, but we want to engage and energize the entire business community, not just the startups. So that was one of the outcomes that the, the data that I, that I collected um, suggested and become a central component of an entrepreneurship ecosystem is the way I would approach one of the goals here. I believe that we need to work closely with the resources that are already here. And as I said, when I spoke to virtually everybody, there was, there was the, the era of, of cooperation. So let's, let's be one and let's get it done. And I think what this does is it creates the, something that's really important here, and that's the synergies that, that exist here in Douglas County. Uh, the, Douglas County doesn't have a UGA, for example, but it does have so much else. But we need to come together, I think, to maximize the effectiveness of what we do here in, in Douglas County. So the alternatives that I considered were, were four different alternatives. One was utilizing existing resources, that is, not having a facility. In order to do that, there are significant resources here. Classrooms at the Chamber, Mercer College, even the Convention Center could be used for, for classrooms. There are existing programs and instructors. The Chamber has a lot of programs. The SBDC is another resource. Uh, professors. Between, what, uh, between the professors that are already here at, at the Mercer's University of West Georgia, I certainly think we should also tap into what's going on in the Atlanta community. And there's also businessmen here who have created programs for entrepreneurs, um, which need to be utilized as well. And of course, we can add new programs as needed. 
The second alternative I considered was to buy an existing co-working space. <coughs> While I was doing the study, uh, I found a co-working space, Station Lockworks is the name, on, on um, uh, Old Memorial, oh, Ver 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 uh, Broad Street, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's for sale. And the good thing about that space is it's 98% occupied. So there's tenants already, there's customers, and there are, there's revenue coming in. The tenants may not be quite the right mix, but nevertheless, there's a foundation that can be built on. It also has expansion capability, and it's close to the chamber, which would be a plus. The third alternative that I analyzed was to rent a 15,000 square foot facility. I believe that 15,000 square feet would be the minimum that's necessary for this initiative to provide the momentum, the presence, and so forth that I think is important. And it would have space for conference rooms, tenant firms, open space, and administrative space. The fourth alternative I considered was renting a 45,000 square foot facility. My recommendation is to rent the 15,000 square foot space, <clears throat> but to create a hybrid model that is part incubator and part co-working space. The purpose of the incubator is to provide that education, mentoring, and coaching, but the, it, it, what, what we would do is to provide different levels of service for the different businesses. Again, new businesses need a different level of service than existing businesses, and we want to be able to provide the right service for the right business. I think that can be done very effectively with some of the programs I've already mentioned, including if we wanted a very formal um, incubator type program, for the moment at least, we can use the affiliate program at the Burson Center. The co-working space is really important though because it allows the manager to effectively utilize the space. Because I, I know one of the questions is how do we pay for this? And I'm going to go through some ways in, in a minute, but by using the co-working space and using the space efficiently, what co-working allows let me go back. What an incubator would typically do is it would bring in anchor tenants. An anchor tenant could be an SBDC, it could be a government agency, it could be a, a law firm. And those tenants often provide services to the client companies, but importantly, they provide rental income for the facility. With a co-working space, part of the objective would be to bring in companies that provide rent, <coughs> provide rental income for the facility. And what a co-working space, the way that works is there are tenants who pay on a monthly basis, usually between three and four hundred dollars, depending upon the size of the space. But what a co-working space also does is it allows for the rent of offices, conference rooms, and so forth on an hourly basis. So if we're getting three to four hundred dollars a month on a monthly basis, but we're able to rent a room for twenty-five to fifty dollars an hour. The possibility is you can even exceed what you would get if you rented it on a monthly basis. But more importantly, if the space is available, it allows it to be used and used in terms of getting rent coming in. So that's the, it's, that's the hybrid model that, that I uh, certainly recommend. But I believe the 15,000 square foot space is it allows for the big bold statement that I believe is important to gain the momentum that you can gain here in Douglas County. It's a distinguishing asset, provides identity, and so forth. My last bullet point on this page is that I recommend you consider combining as many assets, physical assets, in the facility as you're able to do. One example being, you asked me to think outside the box. <laughs> uh, how about a library? Right. Libraries are struggling with the brick and mortar aspect because we're getting information outside of the brick and mortar. And what this entrepreneurship center is, it's really a way to provide information. So one thing to consider would be to combine 
um, the library with the, the entrepreneurship center. It's also another way to, to, to help provide some additional revenue coming in. Because again, I know that's one of the challenges that needs to be considered. Um, another potential idea, which is way outside the box, if you don't mind, um, if you have a, a, a larger facility, would you consider including the chamber in the same space as, as the entrepreneurship center? So it's a one-stop shop for, for business. And you know, it, it, I'm not suggesting that one dominate the other, but that you have both as separate entities within a physical space. It's the synergy that, um, that I just talked about. What I'm not going to present today, but what is in the report, and I urge you to take a look at, is the concept of an innovation district. Right? An innovation district is one that, that doesn't necessarily combine the way I suggested, but that brings the right resources for entrepreneurship and innovation in close proximity to one another. Uh, Atlanta is considered, certain parts of Atlanta are considered innovation districts, and uh, UGA has just received word to move forward to create such a thing in Athens, Georgia. Without having a UGA in Douglas County, you need to utilize um, other synergistic type resources, and I think you have plenty here. One of the other things that I think is important, I, I put, I think, 12 recommendations in the report. I'm not going to go through all of them here. Um, but one of the other recommendations is that this needs to be a hub of activity. And in addition to the educational programs, activities need to be run through the entrepreneurship center. Examples of activities, and again, I've got more in the report, are things like competitions, business plan competitions. Why not have a business plan competition where you give away prize money to you? Shark Tank type of competitions is another example of things that need to happen to create this hub of activity so that there's a lot of buzz going through the entrepreneurship center. I think I said it earlier, but if I didn't, STEM came up several times with people I talked to, and again, with, with youth and with, uh, and, and with young women. That's an activity that I think deserves to come through this entrepreneurial <coughs> center. Uh, when I talked to Google, they mentioned the Gravity Games. You know, need to be synergistic with things of that nature. Uh, in addition, there are meetups, hackathons, and so forth that are important. Uh, a few weeks ago, I attended for the first time what's called the Million Cups, which is a, 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 a monthly meeting of entrepreneurs where one entrepreneur may present an idea and the other entrepreneurs will help vet that idea. So that's another example of an activity that uh, has gained some traction throughout the U.S. I, I wanted to also just try to be as brief as I can. In the report, I put pro forma financial or pro forma financial statement in so you can get a sense of my estimate of costs and revenue. Importantly, revenue will come from multiple sources, not just one source. Uh, rental income, we talked about memberships. An example of a membership is here's somebody who may not reside in the entrepreneurship center but pays $99 a month for three or four hours a week of access to a conference room. And, and there's a lot of different creative ways to create memberships. But it's an additional way of bringing more of income into the entrepreneurship center. Educational programs, workshops, seminars, they need to be open and charged for. <laughs> so we need to charge for those. Uh, I believe that workshop, seminars, speaker series are critical for an entrepreneurship center. And there is a number of people here in Douglas County as well as in the Atlanta area that could be really good speakers, just local, not even going national just yet. Um, the grants and corporate sponsorships are a way that many entrepreneurship centers are funded. And I put some information in there that shows sources on, on a macro basis. Uh, so throughout the, it's a study that was done throughout the country. But the majority of entrepreneurship centers I've seen are, do, do have local funding. Uh, 
the one in Cobb County, the business accelerator in Cobb County, that's corporate sponsor primarily. It's a big company, Comcast is the underwriter for that. I have also put in the, the study a list of four potential grant sources, three are federal, one from the, the EDA, the Economic <laughs> Development uh, Administration, part of the Department of Commerce. A second is uh, the Appalachian Regional Commission and uh, the Bursting Center <laughs> grant from, from them. A third is the a Community block, block Grant, which is actually out of HUD. They do some entrepreneurship funding. And when I talk to Google, as you, I'm sure you know, they have a, a fairly extensive grant program. Um, as you move forward to, to implementation, if this is a choice, I think there's an opportunity to have a, a more serious conversation with Google when there's something specific to, to ask them about. Uh, expenses were occupancy expense, salary expense, uh, the Burson Center, Actually, their salaries are funded largely by the University of West Georgia, to give you a sense. But that is another expense for running this and miscellaneous expenses. My last two recommendations, it really needs to be a public-private partnership. Um, and I believe there is enough private here to make it work very well. And lastly, uh, my, my first recommendation is, as you move, if you move forward, is to form a board of directors, but that can be a real deep organization. Uh, so consider forming a three to five person task force that's responsible for moving it forward. I thank Chris for that. Um, any questions? Any questions from the board or comments, Commissioner uh, Guider? Yes, Mr. Henley, Henley, you mentioned some piece of property that was for sale on Veteran Memorial Highway. Which piece was that? The, the, the name, it's, it's an actual business. The name of the business is Station Lockworks, <coughs> and the gentleman who owns it has owned it for about 10 years now. Where is it located? It's right in downtown. Um, it's in one of the fronts. Um, I'll say it's kind of in, just before the uh, fire department headquarters. Mm -hmm. the old right. Oh, uh, across the street. Yeah. Right there on the corner where the Chevrolet dealership used to be. Like between the whole courthouse and the fire department. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I couldn't catch what, what you were saying. I thought you were calling that name, and I was thinking, what's for sale? The, the name of the business is Station. Is, that big, is it big enough? Uh, you said 15,000 square feet. The, 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 the Station Lockworks Works is about 14,000 square feet, but it's got room for expansion. Both, both within the structure as well as they, they own a, a lot of space. Could, could a, a like a warehouse type building be okay? Mm -hmm. it, uh, where you could put up the little cubby holes. It certainly could. Be, yes. Providers and things like that. Yes. Okay. I back. I'm just trying thank to figure out what. Thank you so much, Commissioner Gardner. Vice Chairman Robinson. Yes. Yeah, so thank, thank you so much, and, and, and thank you, um, Dr. Henley. Uh, for providing this, this uh, I, I gotta read it. I haven't quite got through right. all of this, but but I, I, I appreciate it. You know, he, he mentioned back in 2010 uh, that you came on board. We're in the middle of the recession, right? So I'm only one year in at that time, and it, it was all about everybody was trying to stabilize their households, right? This is 2010. Banking system has collapsed. You've got new leadership in Washington, and we're trying to find our out. And we we knew it was all about the house of one, right? So we, we focused, we, at least I tried to advocate for a focus on let's restore the family. But it, it was all, I mean, so many people were coming into my office, you had grown men crying, people broken, households broken. I mean, it's just, it was what it was during that time period. And it was about stabilizing. So part of that was education, <coughs> all right? So if the bills are due every 30 days and there's no jobs because everything has collapsed, your values have collapsed and everything, it's like, well, if the bills are due every 30 days, Everybody has a talent, a hobby, or a gift that can be monetized, right? I gotta go, right? I gotta make it happen. You know, the good old American spirit, right? Well, while we moved over here to begin with, right? It's opportunity, right? But part of that was education, and he laid down a foundation for us. At the time, we just weren't ready, but it was a seed that was planted, because here we are a decade later, I think we're in a better place to at least hear it better. 
Um, one of the things I think about from an economic development policy that it has to be balanced. You know I'm very big on everything can't be concentrated in one area. Right? I, 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 while I, I support economic development, I also think about but what about everybody else? And the policy needs to be spread. Right? Policy has to be spread across everybody. So I can take $10 million and put it in this area, or I can take $10 million, $10 million divided by $25,000, which was the average, what, startup cost, $25,000. How many more citizens would I be impacting? Right? I do $10 million in one business, I take that $10 million and spread it by $25,000. And how many citizens? It's about balance. And, and so, um, again, this whole point was to, to, to help us think through um, how do we consider um, a greater number of citizens to, to make sure that they're able to realize what they're looking for. Um, I, I, I don't have any idea of what's in here other than what was just presented, so I'm, I'm interested in sort of digging a little bit deeper. But, but one of the things I do get criticism for on economic development was is, uh, and again, I recognize the chamber and me and Sarah's had conversations and Chris knows this, so this is not about them. But it's what the citizens say, which is what they hear is what the media presents, which is, okay, where our, our focus is on all these big companies. You have the little guys like, we're the foundation of this thing. What about us? And so I'm always, you know, it's always, you know, fight for the little person. Make sure that they're not invisible, that we're not just because, um, you know, they're not in the chamber meetings and they're not in the big tables and the big luncheons and stuff that like, okay, but you know, there's a whole bunch of other people out here mm -hmm. and they need to see themselves represented in, in, in obviously our discussion. So um, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear what I'm hearing. I need to process what I just heard. Um, there was a lot of things. One thing I do want to ask, and um, you mentioned space and I, I, I don't have an idea about space yet, um, uh, but in that co-working, what I'm hearing you say is that there needs to be a co, go back to the recommendation about co-working space. Was it that, like executive suites, was it just, I needed somebody, I needed to be somewhere where the atmosphere was right? What, what, what was the premise behind that? What, what, I'm talking about for what your, your feedback, your qualitative comments back. That's all I want to answer. Right, right. There, there, there were several premises behind recommending that the facility be part co-working space. Yeah. One, one was because entrepreneurs are looking for co-working space. Uh, I mentioned that the co-working space here in, in Douglas County is 98% occupied. And that one of the entrepreneurs who I talked to had to move initially to Atlanta to, to get co-working space. So it's something that entrepreneurs are looking for. It is also something that will provide a, a vibrant atmosphere that I think is important for the, the innovation and and entrepreneurship that we're looking for. But also from a practical standpoint, it's going to help bring more revenue in. Um, many incubators are 50% occupied. You know, that's not, in my opinion, going to get it for what Douglas County is looking for. So by incorporating the co-working space, it provides services and value to the entrepreneurs but it also provides, from a practical standpoint, revenue coming into the facility. So is, is, is it, so I got the co-working space, so it, there's, there's physical space, hard costs, right? That, that uses, it's obviously very expensive, gotta pay rent, gotta pay mortgage, I get it. Um, but it, um, I'm hearing more emphasis on space as opposed to education, right? Um, or is it about, is it both? In other words, I heard workshops, I heard seminars. Right. I know we're in the, the lifestyle of the YouTube and I can look at a video versus my old school. I had to go through you know, three, four years of school to do what I had to do. Right. Um, what are you hearing? I'm, I'm just trying to wrap this right. up and bring it back down. So what about facility and what about the soft things, the, the, the programming? Did, did, did not need to leave that impression. I think the education is so critical uh, because I, as you may remember, as you may know, I'm an educator, so I really believe education is, is one of the keys to business success. Real quick, what, what a background. What, explain to the public, who are you? What's your background? <laughs> Just, I, mean, I think that's relevant. Right. Um, currently teaching at, at Georgia Tech, I'm teaching uh, venture creation, so entrepreneurship there. Uh, years ago, I taught at Georgia State. I was the, actually the um, entrepreneurship center director. But I've been teaching entrepreneurship in various places for probably 20 years now. Um, so it is, from an educational standpoint, something that I not only believed in, but move forward to, to be able to do what I think is important. Your education? My education? 
Um, my PhD is from Columbia University, and my undergrad is from MIT. I've got an MBA at Columbia as well. Yeah. Uh, but but so so education is to answer your, your first question. Ed education is absolutely critical. What I'm suggesting is that because we want to be able to help both new and and existing businesses, that we need to be flexible and adaptable in the way we deliver that education. I think the resources are here to deliver a very formal year-long class, uh, even if we have to do an affiliate program with the Burson Center. What, what, what's important there is we're not spending the money making the commitment for that year-long program until we know there's a demand for it. Uh, what I am suggesting is that there is a demand, a demonstrated demand for, for shorter programs, whether it's five-week programs or one-hour programs. So the recommendation is to make sure the Entrepreneurship Center here is adaptable in the way it delivers its education so that it's most effective for the business owner's needs here. So again, I didn't mean to leave the impression that, that space was the only thing. It's, it's absolutely the education, and uh, again, I think that's so critical. No, you basically answered my question. I'm John Gilbert. Okay. okay, thank you. Commissioner Carpenter, we'll be happy. Yes. I, I did take the time to read all <laughs> wow. of the report. Um, I'm just nerdy like that. So one of the things that I really appreciate was you thinking outside the box and then including libraries. I oh. think it is the original co-working space because people come in and they they look for ways to do things and the first place they think about doing that is in a library right so the library that I'm looking at for district 3 I think would be a great space <coughs> for innovation center um, one because you want an innovation center you could correct me if I'm wrong you want it to be accessible to everybody yes you want it to be a place I'm assuming that people are comfortable with that they feel as though the people that they are coming to there would actually have their best interests at heart. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Um, is a place where young and old can converge? Yes. Why is that important? Oh, I, th I think the youth certainly are the leaders of, of tomorrow. And uh, some of the students I teach, I actually will say some of, there's some of the leaders of today, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to nurture our own youth in doing the right things the right way, especially from a business standpoint. Uh, and I think part of that is the education, but also I think part of that are the role models that the, that the older, older <laughs> I don't know what older means, but, but that adults can, can certainly provide. I think from a, 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 as an older person, I look to the youth for some things that I'm not comfortable with, specifically technology things. So I think it's, I, think, I like to use the word synergistic, I don't want to overuse it, but I believe by bringing youth and, and, and adults in to the same facility at the same time, um, I do think it's a synergistic uh, opportunity to help everyone. Gotcha, Dave. In some of your report, I believe I read that further the concept assumes that people desire more choices that include where, how to live, play, and walkable. Mm -hmm. um, accessibility to facilities. So. Yeah. Yes, that's the concept of the of the innovation district. Mm -hmm. That if you want more literature on, I'd be happy to send it. Mm -hmm. But also very consistent uh, with what certainly Douglasville is doing, and I believe Douglas County is doing. You know, there there is a, a general trend on the, the work live play concept, and some of the developments that are coming up really embody that. It's, it's all combined. But yes, I think that's that's the way, that, that's what I'm, we're, we're seeing trends, particularly in real estate. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, and one other thing, you talked about including the chamber. Yes. In it. Yes. And I believe the chamber already has a co-starter program yes. of some sort. Mm -hmm. So did you see how valuable, viable, what the metrics were for, for that? and how that would impact. I, I, I didn't see, see the metrics, but my recommendations, my, my observations are that there's tremendous resources that already exist here. You mentioned the Coast Order Program, the Chamber also does the, the Sustainability Program, which mm -hmm. is for businesses that have been around for a while. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that is very important for what I'm recommending with the Entrepreneurship Center. So we, the Douglas County needs to work together, and again, what's I've seen tr really tremendous 
resources are right here. So it's certainly not an either or. It's it's let's work together to make it even better. And your recommendation is to put all of those in one place so that existing or those who want to start. Can I think that's a conversation that needs to be had. I'm not I'm not trying to take away from I get it. From, from I get it. Channel. But yes. but what I'm hearing overall is to make sure that we have consistent way of the, getting that information. Yes, so that is information programs that should be part of the entrepreneurship center. So, Again, I'm not saying let's take it away from where it right. is so much. But right, and we definitely, right. I think Douglas County, at least since I've been here and have seen Sarah Ray in action, yep. one Douglas is, is the company. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you. I you. All right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Henley, for presenting today. Uh, I really appreciate your depth and breadth of uh, knowledge and information that you provided today as we go forward uh, for this much needed um, initiative here in Douglas County. And also your out of the box thinking was just amazing um, because it's very important that we blend both the new and the existing business. And I believe you and you have that conversation you met with me about looking at our existing businesses as well. So we thank you and we're, we're hoping that we will make this happen in Douglas County because it's important for our small businesses. We do recognize how important they are. I'd like to thank everyone for, for helping in their input. And certainly I'm available. Oh, thank you so much, thank Dr. You. Henley. <coughs> All right, uh, uh, we're gonna see if we can put the pedal to the metal and move on to the next item we're gonna push. We're going to go start with business uh, item tab number six, uh, authorization to approve a new alcohol license, and it will be a public hearing tomorrow for Miranda Property Resources LLC at 230 Thornton Road, Suite A, Lithia Springs, Georgia. Our manager is Ron Roberts of Planning and Planning. Hello, Ron. Good morning, Madam Good morning. Chair, Commissioners. Good afternoon. Yes, staff is in, in, in possession of a completed packet for this application, which I've also put into uh, city clerk for y'all to review as well. Um, received the payment, we've got the, the applicant's gone through the RAS certification training as required. The background check has been completed. Um, letters of support are in here, all the Secretary of State <coughs> forms, everything's in here, and she will be in attendance tomorrow for the public. Okay, thank you so much. Any questions from the board? We'll move on to the next one. Tab number seven, authorization to amend the senior services uh, budget for donations received uh, for the senior picnic in the amount of $1,879. Is Mr. Hagen here, Richard Hagen, or? I saw Ms. Sharon earlier. Mark, do you want, Mark, you want to take this one? Yeah, she was here earlier. Um, so essentially, this we do this every year. Um, well, this is actually senior services. This is Richard Hagen, isn't it? Yeah, Sharon was gonna present. Okay, so it's Richard Hagen's office. So they get a portion of the uh, donations for the senior picnic. So that's all it is, is just authorization to accept those and amend their budget. Okay. All right, any questions from the board? I'm gonna move on to tab number eight, authorization to accept the grant from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council for the State Court DUI Drug Court in the amount of $96,164 with matching funds of $10,685 for the grant fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2019 through June 2020, June 30th, 2020, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents uh, and amend the budget as necessary. Uh, Anita Granger. Ms. Granger. Hi, uh, Madam Commissioner. Um, any questions about that? It's the same grant that we apply for every year, the 10%. The match is taken out of my salary, um, so that's already in the budget. There's not any, um, there may be some slight adjustments to this year's budget because I've gotten more monies from CJCC this year. So I may have to um, send that email out after I figure out what the adjustments upward would be. Um, but otherwise, um, I just ask that y'all accept the money. Oh, <laughs> pretty simple, it's pretty sorry. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. No questions. Great, thank All you. All right, you're welcome. Tab number nine, authorization to accept $318.650, I'm sorry, $318,000. Uh, $650 uh, from the Ameris Bank from the defaulted letters of uh, credit for the completion of the asphalt top, topping in Tuscany Hills subdiv uh, subdivision and to place the funds into the assigned fund balance. Director Worthington. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, I'll continue the trend of asking you to accept money instead of spend money. That's yeah, a good that's thing. Right. Right. Uh, this is, like I said, just uh, it was letters of credit for Tuscany Hills subdivisions. Um, it's for the topping. 
topping's not in, the bank didn't want to carry the, the letter of credit anymore, so they submitted the funds to us. So if we accept it, we'll look to the future about um, either paying it in the house or, or using a contractor to pay. Okay, any questions from the board? Uh, what district is this in, do you know? This is... Oh, it's three. Three. Uh, is it a PVC subdivision? Uh, this is a little different because the subdivision is, is approved, it's planted. So it's not like our some of those other little pipe farms we had. But this is planted, but there's no homes built in it. No, there is a clubhouse built in. There is a nice clubhouse. Yes. Yes. Off 166? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, very nice. Floor has been yielded to the vice chairman. Any other questions on this one? All right, thank you. thank you. We'll keep going. Next item. Next item is number 10 authorization to approve task order 2019 4 in the amount of $1,400 for additional work required by the Georgia EPD at the landfill. And I'm glad the chairman is on all related documents. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bring back the same old EPD stuff. They want money. <laughs> Unfunded money. Uh, the $1,400 one out of 10 was where, contrary to popular belief, they do not come out to the landfill very often and do any type of testing or analysis. It's all on paper, it's digital. So they look at it at the trade board where the offices are at, and if there's something that doesn't look quite right, then they send us some uh, communication. In this particular case, they thought something was out of whack with the uh, <coughs> chemical constituency, but it wasn't. And the only way to get to it is to use our consultant almost like an attorney. They go down there and argue our case. In this particular case, we were right, they were wrong, but we still had to pay $1,400. Mm. Are you kidding? It's just uh, it's like an, no offense to attending counsel, like an attorney, you're going to pay them win, lose, or draw. So they go down there and take up for us and uh, argue our point. It could have been terrible if there had really been something wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. So $1,400 is pretty reasonable to get off the hook. Okay. And, uh, any questions on that? All right, so you, you've got your budget. Sir? You're going to cover, cover this cost? We do. Right. Yeah, we'll cover it. Yeah. We, we always try to put some contingency money in our line item account for professional services just in case. Correct. Contingency, well, I guess. It's in case every year. So. Any questions from the commissioners? No. Okay. Ready? Yep. <clears throat> Next one, number 11, is authorization to approve task order 2019 5 in the amount of $19,930 for the 2019 winter groundwater sampling and monitoring and reporting to Georgia EPD and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Same thing. Up again? Yes, sir. Yeah, we really, uh, we really do the budget for this in the correct amounts. Now, if we find something that's not particularly right or wrong, we have to add to it. And uh, this is for, we're just now finishing up our summer event. We do it twice a year, mandated. And uh, it goes to the, let me see, it goes to the company that actually tests for constituents in the groundwater. And so this is for December. I'd like to go ahead and get it out there early in the year. We're, uh, we're not grasping for straws. That's, that's pretty much it. <coughs> so that's it. Um, any questions? Well, Madam Chair, is back. I'll finish this before I go. So, um, so Clarity, did you say you needed money for this? No. Or that you don't? We budget for it in you the August, for beginning in August. Okay, beginning in August. I'm sure you don't that for you. Okay. So, board of commissioners, you're okay with it? Okay. Sounds thank you. good. Yes, ma'am. Thank you're you. You're welcome. Board you. well, number tab number 11 now. 12. 12. 12. Okay. Authorization, tab number 12. Authorization to amend the budget and accept a grant award in the amount of $53,500 from the Council of Accountability Court Judges for the Family Treatment Court and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Jennifer King. Yes, ma'am. This is our um, grant award we get from the state every year. <coughs> the amount this year is fifty-three thousand five hundred, with a match of five thousand nine hundred and forty-four. Okay. Any questions from the board? Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Carthen. Jennifer, where does the match come from? 
Um, the match for this is, <coughs> I'm sorry, out of supplies, travel, and some evaluations we do on participants. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Okay, well, I'll move on to the next one, Jennifer. Authorization to accept the Family uh, <coughs> Connections Grant Award in the amount of $50,000 for Douglas Core and authorize the children to sign all related documents and amend the budget. Um, could you explain this to us? Yes, this is the um, also the yearly grant award from Family Connections for Douglas Core um, for the amount of 50000 Okay, any questions from the board? Okay. And we'll move on to the next one. Thank you so much, Jennifer. <coughs> Tab number 14, authorization to accept the cashier's check in the amount of $11,362.26 from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office by the order of the Douglas County Superior Court as abandoned prop property, less uh, $330 to be reimbursed to the Department 280, other professional services for advertising costs and amended <coughs> budget as necessary. Um, Major Holmes. Good morning, or good afternoon, excuse me. Um, this is the, uh, the results of the order for the disposition of abandoned property by Judge McClain that we, I think this is, we haven't done one in the last couple of years. This is monies that have been acquired through investigations and things that are abandoned and unclaimed, as well as what I've been told is also like the food courthouse and things like that that folks leave money. And uh, so that's, a, that's the total of this amount. Okay. Any questions from the board? I'll move on. Thank you so much, uh, Major Holmes. Tab number 15, authorization to approve a contract with Google for the installation of free Wi-Fi on Connect Douglas 12 fixed routes um, and paratransit cutaways and authorized children to sign all related documents. Director Watson. Yes, ma'am. Just as the agenda item says, Google is offering to install Wi-Fi on the vehicles that we'll be using for our fixed route service and our paratransit service. Uh, the installation is free. It's scheduled to uh, be done tomorrow, and then once we start the service Thursday, the Wi-Fi will be free to all of our riders. And that's this is basically what the contract is saying. Okay. Any questions from the board? Yeah. 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 Uh, it, um, that's good news. I. I um, Gary, that's, that's good news that uh, we're able to, again, you've got a corporate citizen here that's um, adding value in essence. I, I Obviously, um, it helps promote the Google brand, but nonetheless, it's something that obviously our citizens can benefit with. If you've ever been in uh, trains or anything like that, or buses per se, you know, reception is not good, but having this service here uh, will help their, their the continuity of their mobility experience. So I'm encouraged by that. Real quick, um, um, County um, Attorney Ken Bernard, um, have you taken a look at this? Are we good? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, there's three points that y'all probably need to be aware of. First, there's, this is a three-year provision because it allows them to get essentially sponsorship in exchange for providing it. Uh, and the, since the county is receiving something rather than paying something, I don't know that I'm terribly upset about that. Right. Uh, I will say there's some intellectual property rights and probably between now and tomorrow, Gary, it might be appropriate for our technology folks to make sure they've looked at this contract uh, just from a spec standpoint because there's some <coughs> other cross-intellectual property issues that we just need to make sure it's correct. I will say this, that if there's a breach, you can terminate after 30 days uh, written notice. Uh, if there's a bankruptcy, you can uh, terminate. Uh, they may terminate convenience without cause, without further liability upon written notice. There's no early out unless there's a breach for the county in three years, and it's probably because <coughs> the value of the technology is being put in to allow the service to operate is what I'm guessing. So if Bill doesn't have any problem with it, I don't, legal's not going to say anything because we're actually supposedly getting something. But I will say that you're exchanging something, you're exchanging sponsorship for something, so if there's a quid pro quo, I just want to make sure we're not violating any policy, Bill. Do you, are you well, are they going to put Google on the side of the the vans? No. How will they advertise that they provide the service? Uh, from my, my understanding with Wi-Fi, there's a landing page. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's where they're going to have their... Yeah, it's called a splash page. I think. And well, there's a splash page and a landing page. I don't know what those are. That's why I suggested the technology folks just at least browse it here. I, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Uh, can I just say one more thing to yes. Commissioner Robinson's uh, question? 
the county cannot filter the uh, the, uh, the service. In other words, somebody's free to get on it and go to any page they want to, and I just want y'all to know that that's what's in this contract. Okay. So somebody theoretically, I said, go into something not good, but. I just want to but they can do the same thing from our libraries. So Theoretically, yeah. Mm -hmm. on phones. So duly noted, but it is for those who need to have access to complete a call, whatever the case may be, or log on to find out where they are, um, they can use this service. I get it. Now, and Ken, you've answered my question. Um, you said at the end of three years. So this is not at the end of three years. We're now going to have to pay something, right? And this is this like some type of freebie moment, but then they're going to, it's not that, right? Gary, I'm not aware of a payment at the end of three years. Are you? In, in talking to the Google folks, uh, they actually are calling this a grant. <coughs> so I would hope that at the end of three years, we might be able to go back and, and get it renewed. A, a grant with a sponsorship? Wait, say that again? It's a grant. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure I heard what I heard. It's a grant. It's, you said sponsorship. I got that. But now, <coughs> what's the difference? I mean, how are well, we? One, one thing that's in here, Commissioner Robinson, I think that maybe there's the, the, the gray area between a grant and a gift is they're saying in here you can't have another service provide the same service to overlap them. In other words, it's exclusive. So, you know, I, we're sit, I guess sit it from a fence standpoint is that the value we're receiving sufficient for the county and in this agreement with them. I'm, I'm, I won't believe it. I'm, I'm fine with what I hear. It just makes me, again, this is, we appreciate that it is um, um, it, their support. I uh, just want to, okay, I'm going to yield for right now. I may have different questions tomorrow, but I'll yield for now. I'm good. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cotty, did you want to say something? I saw your hand. Did you need something? No, you're good. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're just <laughs> rushing yeah. something off. Okay, well, thank you so much, Director Watson. Yeah. All right, I'll move on to tab number 16, with this, which is authorization to approve a supplemental agreement number two in the amount of $5,468 with R.J. Haney and Associates Incorporation for additional quantities of items required due to changes in field conditions in connection with the ITS expansion project P1 number 0012622 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, this item was originally on the agenda about uh, two meetings ago, and it was pulled off the agenda because there was some work that we were hopeful that the DOT would do for us rather than have the county pay, and uh, I'm happy to report that they have agreed to do about 75% of the work that was needed as part of their uh, Route 92 project. So. What this will do is allow for uh, connectivity of all the traffic signals along <coughs> State Route 92. Okay. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Yep. Okay, yes. Vice Chairman Brown. Through State Route 92, all, mm -hmm. all lights from Paulding all the way down to the river or just in a certain area? Well, all of them would, would have eventually been connected. This is going to pull the ones from south of I-20 up. Oh. Oh. Got it. Alright. You answered my question. Thank you. Madam Chair, and this is uh, CTF, correct? Miguel? Yes. It would be uh, funded through the CTF. Transportation fund. Uh -huh. <coughs> gotcha. Okay. <coughs> we'll move on to tab number 17, authorization to approve a supplemental agreement number five with Michael Baker International Incorporation in the amount of $152,304.09 for additional design services in connection with the Lee Road Phase Two widening project P1000-4428 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin again. Yes, Madam Chair. Th this is uh, the work that is needed in order to get this project through construction. Uh, this uh, additional expenditure is to pull the plants off the shelf, update them to current standards, and get it ready for bid. Uh, but the uh, additional work is not non-reimbursable. So uh, this item is on the agenda, on the uh, transportation committee <coughs> agenda tomorrow for discussion as to the source of the funds. 
uh, again, there's the Capital Transportation Fund or SPLOST, and that's a discussion for tomorrow's meeting. Okay. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? All right, we're going to move on. Thank you so much, uh, Director Valentin. Tab number 18, authorization to accept a check from the State Port Technology Fund in the amount of seven, $775 for the purchase of a laptop. Uh, Director Hallman. Uh, yes, um, we received a court order from the State um, Court of Douglas County uh, wanting to uh, submit $775 from their State Port Technology Fund. Um, and we treat this check just like we do when we get a check from the sheriff asset forfeiture just bring it before y'all no matter what the amount <coughs> is it's coming from another fund um, to accept it and then we deposit it and then they can run it through the new world system to get the laptop just a formality okay any questions from the board board of commissioners this was a pretty uh, robust meeting and thank you all for your patience today and and uh, at one moment, my stomach growled for a while. I didn't know what it was in here, so I apologize for that. But anyway, uh, for, uh, I think this time I will, I will call, I will check with our attorney to see if we need to go in the executive session. Do Madam, we? Madam Chair, we're going to need uh, for real estate, legal, and personnel, and we'll go in that order so we can get to stick around. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? We have a motion and a second, please. All in favor, raise your right hand. Okay. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Guy, you're talking. Do you want to say, do you want to go into executive session, Commissioner? We, did you, aye. Did you say aye? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, it was a unanimous vote and the motion carries. Uh, take 10 minutes, you're done. Get your lunch and then come on back.